good evening and welcome all members assembled here and welcome the college webinar on wednesday evenings this webinar is a special edition webinar this is supported by the members of american society of anesthesiologists and society for ambulatory anesthesia and we are focusing on certain special topics these topics are going to be moderated by dr belani our international dean from usa as well as dr jayashri sood our president and our dean dr murlidhar from india uh, thank you uh, dr radha krishna today as dr radha krishna said it's a very special day and we have very special speakers for this uh, webinar the international faculty is there and again it's my great pleasure to welcome professor dr bilani for this webinar as the moderator he is the international dean of the indian college of anesthesiologists so dr bilani it's a great pleasure to have you as the moderator today could you please introduce the speakers and thank we can you. start the webinar thank you dr jayshri sood and thank you dr radha krishnan and dr sanish and dr mulidhar and dr bala krishnan for joining this wonderful webinar and we have uh, special topics in anesthesia today and i would like to introduce uh, first speaker dr larry lindenbaum who is my colleague at work and he is an associate professor of anesthesiology and critical care medicine and he's uh, is one of the executives uh, the medical director for for our practice which is m health fairview and his areas of interest besides non operating room anesthesia which he does so well in our place is thoracic neuro and toxicology uh, patient monitoring and patient safety so dr lindenbaum thank you for willing to do this and uh, i invite you to do your presentation thank you very much for that wonderful introduction dr balani and thank you all for allowing me to be here tonight um i wanted to spend my name is uh, larry lindenbaum again uh, and i wanted to spend a little bit of time Uh, of this special topics to speak specifically on uh, non-operating room anesthesia, uh, safety principles, and practice. Um, uh, so to get started, what exactly is NORA? Well, uh, NORA or non-operating room anesthesia uh, it includes anesthetics in a hospital but outside of the OR at its very broadest definition. This would include outpatient anesthetics in ambulatory surgery centers. Uh, and, as well as office suites. Um, NORA includes everything from labor epidurals to gastroenterology lab sedation to facilitation of radiology procedures to outpatient cataracts, joint replacements and pediatric dental sedation, office-based plastic and neurological procedures, etc. Um unlike cases concentrated in the OR suite, um NORA cases are scattered across multiple units of the hospital in small outpatient facilities. presenting new and different challenges to safe and efficient staffing and you can see from this large but not completely comprehensive list nora is really becoming a very large portion of everybody's practice and sort of understanding how these subtle differences can apply to us on a day-to-day -day basis are very important um away from the operating room um the anesthesiologist may lack familiar equipment and staff uh, experienced in the care of uh anesthetized patients nora uh therefore presents unique challenges and a systematic approach using the simple three step paradigm of the patient the procedure and the environment is recommended this is the paradigm recommended and uh espoused by the society of ambulatory anesthesia uh in the united states which is our governing body um under the asa for um uh, nora based procedures more specifically regarding this paradigm uh the the patient you know that the consideration for the patient is are that they they may require sedation or anesthesia to tolerate uh, non operating room procedures for any number of reasons children often require sedation or anesthesia for diagnostic and therapeutic procedures 
Patients with significant comorbidities, excuse me, or surgical disease may be too ill to tolerate a major operative procedure, whereas a palliative, less invasive non-OR procedure may be possible. All patients presenting for NORA, however, require a thorough pre-anesthesia assessment and the development of a sound anesthetic plan with appropriate levels of monitoring. Regarding the procedure, as you can tell from that list, there are so many uh, non-operating room procedures, but the anesthesiologist must understand the details of those procedures, specifically the position the patient will be in, how painful the procedure may be, how long it will take, and any special requirements, such as use of contrast media or the need to wake the patient partway through the procedure. Preoperative communication with the procedure list is essential and cannot be stressed enough, and it must include discussion of contingency plans for emergencies and complications. Finally, the environment. Unlike in the operating rooms, the conditions under which NORA services are delivered may vary greatly in terms of the space, equipment, and staff available. A number of factors contribute to uh, NORA sites being unfamiliar and less optimal environments for anesthesia providers. So what's really driving NORA and, and why is it that, that we as anesthesiologists are really getting involved? I, you know, for, the, for, for much of the past, many of these non-operating room cases were actually just done by the proceduralists, right? They had nurses that took care of um, uh, conscious sedation. So, so what's changing? Well, well, first off, what's driving this? Uh, it, it, what's driving this growth in NORA-based procedures can be attributed to many, many driving influences, including and and potentially uh, most importantly, the advent of less invasive procedures. On top of an aging population with increasing comorbidity burden, the introduction of new technology expanding the indications for and complexity of NORA cases and the economics of a healthcare environment that looks to improve value by decreasing costs. With these advances in growth, new demands on the anesthesia team are challenging conventional methods. Increasingly, NORA cases may require more invasive monitoring techniques and deeper levels of sedation that carry the potential for increased patient risk and injury. Advances in surgical tech have made traditional inpatient procedures safe enough to move to ambulatory surgery centers. Examples include knees, hips, and shoulder replacements, many of which were never done outside of the OR until recently. Uh, many minor surgeries, and more recently, um, uh, 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 robotic surgeries, uh, including hernias, prostate, and intraperitoneal surgeries, have also been moving to the outpatient uh, setting. On the non-surgical side, technology has enabled minimally invasive procedures that are complex enough to require an anesthesia clinician for support. Examples include complex ERCPs, cardiac electrophysiology ablations, and transcatheter aortic valve uh, replacements. Many non-operative procedures are performed under sedation, or what's really these days monitored anesthesia care. Remember, anesthesia care may be thought of as a continuum with a gradual transition from the awake state to a progressively deepening sedation to general anesthesia. As sedation deepens, progressive blunting of the airway reflexes with the potential for airway obstruction, together with depression of spontaneous ventilation, can ensue. The individual responsiveness of patients to different sedative agents varies, as do the levels of stimulation during the course of a procedure. Consequently, during the course of a non-operating room procedure, uh, under, you know, quote unquote, sedation, the patient may drift to a deeper level than is intended resulting in airway and respiratory depression. It is therefore essential that the person providing the sedation be properly trained to care for a patient who drifts to a deeper level of sedation than the level originally intended. So, so to, to address part of my first question, can it be done without us? Sometimes, maybe, but should it? I'm not so sure about that. You know, there are three other benefits which also drive the inclusion of anesthesiologists in this case, aside from the fact that we are experts in the uh, providing of anesthesia and analgesia in these, in these situations. These three uh, uh, items are, uh, number one, patient safety improvements. Now, I say probably. The reason I say probably is because this is truly difficult to validate because our, we have a very low rate of perioperative adverse events to start with. 
So it's very difficult to show that that number is truly improved. Um, but it makes sense that adding experienced anesthesiologists to the mix would improve decision making. Number two, patient satisfaction improves. This is very easy to demonstrate, but it is very hard to define the economic value of this improvement, which brings me to number three, improved efficiency. Efficiency of the unit has been demonstrated over and over again to improve as more procedures are able to be done in the same amount of time. This increased efficiency is partly explained by the presence of extra personnel to keep things moving, but it is also due to the expertise of the anesthesia clinicians in using agents such as propofol, remifentanil, and dexmedetomidine that provide good procedural conditions with rapid emergence and readiness for discharge. While safety is uh, sine qua non and, and patient satisfaction is nice to have, but very hard to value, it is honestly the increase in efficiency that leads hospitals and outpatient facilities to request more NORA services. Even units such as cardiac catheterization um, that have historically managed procedural sedation on their own are now requesting anesthesiologist involvement. Combined with a fixed supply of anesthesia personnel, which are typically already fully utilized, the demand for new and expanded coverage is the largest challenge facing most anesthesia practices today and what drives an arms race to recruit and retain clinicians. Further, this pressure to continue the increased efficiency raises additional questions regarding safety and, and additional possible concerns, which we as the anesthesia providers also need to uh, address. So what are some of these uh, concerns that we have in the NORA uh, environment and how do we manage them? Well, we all know how to deliver anesthesia. So what's different? Uh, even among anesthesiologists, it's, what's, it's well recognized that non-OR locations pose patient safety risks because we're working outside the operating room with not the usual standards of equipment and monitoring and, as well as teamwork with which we're accustomed. At the same time, the rapid rise in NORA has allowed specialists to treat patients who previously, who, excuse me, who previously would have been considered too old or too sick for a longer surgery in the OR. This combination of older, sick patients undergoing new advanced procedures outside the OR, where providers may not necessarily have the team or equipment they're used to working with, or where the anesthesia equipment might be in the wrong place, really poses the hazards to patient safety. Now, you can see from these graphs on the left, uh, some of the changes that I'm, I'm talking about with respect to patient demographics in the non-operative space. NOR procedures are performed on a higher percentage of patients older than 50. Uh, most recently, it was looked at about 61.2, uh, excuse me, 62% of patients were older 50, over 50 in the NOR space, whereas only about 55% were over 50 in the OR space. Possibly more importantly is the fact that the ASA physical status scores of three to five are considerably higher in the non-operative uh, uh, location than they are in the operative locations. Further, compared with operating room claims, remote location claims involved older and sicker patients, and the proportion of claims for death was increased in remote locations. 54% of those claims in remote locations were were related to older and sicker patients in the non-operating room environment, whereas only 29% were related to death in the operating room environment. Respiratory events were more common in remote location with inadequate oxygenation and ventilation, the most common specific event uh, on the order of seven times as frequent. Further, remote location claims were more often judged as being preventable by better monitoring techniques versus operating room claims on the order of four to five times. So as can be surmised from this data, patients undergoing NORA procedures compared to those performed in the operating room have a higher frequency of severe injury and death. It is not merely that, and this is not merely due to their increased ASA physical status or age. In more than half of the NORA related claims involving deaths, patients were deemed to have received substandard anesthesia care preventable by improved monitoring techniques. Suboptimal care and failure to provide safe practice were seen as the leading cause of poor outcomes. Most claims were related to respiratory events, specifically inadequate oxygenation and or ventilation. 
Monitored anesthesia care was the most common anesthetic technique used, contributing to about 50% of claims. Oversedation, leading to respiratory depression, was implicated in a third of all claims. In most claims related to oversedation, there was limited use of monitoring uh, end tidal CO2, or in fact, any monitoring at all. The majority of NORA closed claim cases originate in the GI uh, endoscopy suite. Now, this might be related to the sheer volume of cases performed there as compared to other venues, but that's a little difficult to tease out, again, because the incidences are so low to begin with. So what about the suites themselves? Well, in addition to patient-related uh, reasons for increased uh, risk, other factors also contribute to higher morbidity and mortality in these locations. Primarily amongst those are the fact that these suites were built for the proceduralist, often with little or no consideration for the anesthesia team or their needs. These are usually suites that are repurposed to have anesthesia providers come in, rather than suites that are built uh, de novo with input from the anesthesia team. Further, the proceduralists often forget that these patients are much, much sicker than those that they have been accustomed to treating in, in these suites prior to our involvement. And they therefore downplay the risks involved both to us and to the patients, calling this just sedation and, and further encouraging us to move things along at a faster pace than we might otherwise be comfortable doing. Further, um, changes in the personnel and support team also play an area, uh, play, play a role in this risk. Anesthesia professionals are trained to operate within the operating area and dealing specifically with these anesthetized patients and these critical moments. In contrast, non-operating procedure rooms are usually individualized and customized for specific procedures. Personnel working in the NORA environment may be unfamiliar with operating room protocols at all and be uncomfortable or unfamiliar with patients under anesthesia. They may have a focused medical or clinical background and are unfamiliar with anesthesia-related problems and emergency protocols. Similarly, the anesthesia teams may be treated as outsiders in that they may not be familiar with a specialized facility, its environment, staff organization, workflow, or communication. It can't be stressed enough. Open, free communication among the staff is paramount to safe practice and barriers to sharing information should be identified and addressed. Compliance by staff to patient safety protocols should be augmented by regular instruction and evaluation. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about some specific considerations for very specific NORA environments. I don't wanna take away from any of my esteemed colleagues talks. So I'm going to keep this limited since I know that they're addressing some of these things uh, specifically. So uh, the gastroenterology suite. The gastroenterology suite is probably the most common uh, 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 location to provide uh, uh, non-operating room anesthesia. In fact, in the United States, it's estimated that approximately 34 million colonoscopies and endoscopies will be performed this year. Now, not all of them will be with anesthesia, but increasingly we are seeing more and more that the gastroenterologists uh, prefer our involvement in these cases in part, again, because of the increased patient satisfaction and because of the increased turnover, allowing them to get more done in less time. The unique flow, uh, excuse me, the unique workflow of endoscopy creates special considerations for anesthesiologists and patient management and anesthesia delivery. The presence of the endoscope and its placement can cause external compression and lead to upper airway obstruction. Some endoscopic procedures require patients, patients to be in the prone or semi-prone position, which can further compromise respiratory mechanics and limit access to the patient's airway, making it potentially difficult to manage the airway during a procedure. From a technique perspective, many of these cases can be done with MAC along with topicalization of the oropharynx with nebulized lidocaine for upper endoscopic procedures. And in fact, this is the preferred method in most endoscopy centers as general anesthesia tends to decrease efficiency. Nonetheless, it's our responsibility to do what is most appropriate every time for every patient. Interventional pulmonology, uh, another uh, growing location. Pulmonary medicine has greatly expanded its repertoire of therapeutic interventions, utilizing flexible or rigid bronchoscopic techniques. These procedures range from endobronchial ultrasound with transbronchial needle aspiration 
to balloon bronchoplasty and from airway stents to valves to bronchoalveolar lavages. There are several preoperative considerations for interventional pulmonology to consider. Patient position is very important as during interventional pulmonology procedures, hyperextension of the neck is frequently required. As a result, patients should be assessed for risk factors for an unstable cervical spine. For instance, rheumatoid arthritis or recent, even potentially distant uh, maxillofacial trauma. A pre-procedural blood gas should be evaluated in some patients to establish a baseline if there is a history of significant hypoxemia and or hypercarbia, as this may be acutely worsened by the procedure itself. Targeted neural blockade of the superior laryngeal nerve in order to suppress the clock reflex and the recurrent laryngeal nerve can provide adequate oral pharyngeal anesthesia by itself. Ultimately, the approach to topical anesthesia, sedation, and analgesia for interventional pulmonology cases needs to account for the complexity, duration, and settings of the procedure. Many endobronchial ultrasound procedures are well managed with a supraglottic airway and general anesthesia. However, consideration must be given to the specific supraglottic device utilized to ensure that the bronchoscope can pass easily through its lumen, especially given that some manufacturers fenestrate the opening in the oropharynx and others may or may not have removable circuit connectors, making insertion potentially more difficult. Interventional cardiology. The expanding toolkit of interventional cardiology continues to evolve. Using catheter-based interventions to treat structural heart problems and coronary artery disease. Techniques range widely from percutaneous coronary intervention to percutaneous transcatheter aortic valve replacements for patients who are poor surgical candidates. Similarly, in patients with mitral regurgs due to left ventricular failure, transcatheter mitral valve repair represents an alternative treatment with potentially fewer complications when, when compared to open mitral valve valve repair. In fact, recently, it was demonstrated that patients undergoing uh, uh, transcatheter mitral valve repair had lower rates of hospitalization and lower all-cause mortality at 24-month follow-up when compared to medical management alone. So you can expect this procedure to continue to rise in volume. Monitoring interventional cardiology patients should emphasize detection of hemodynamic changes. In this dynamic environment, external defibrillator pads should be easily accessible during procedures because of the increased risk of arrhythmias, and often they should simply be placed on the patient prophylactically prior to the beginning. Anesthesia healthcare providers should generally utilize arterial and or central venous pressure monitoring for higher risk patients or complex procedures. Here, a continuous and frequent objective value of the patient's blood pressure provides clinicians with an early recognition of hemodynamic changes during the procedure. Similarly, transthoracic or transesophageal echocardiography can be used as an adjunct for diagnostic imaging and monitoring of cardiac function. While there is no standardized anesthetic technique in this location, it is important for the anesthesiologist and interventional cardiologist to create a plan to allow for optimal conditions for the interventional cardiologist while providing the safest care during each case. How about interventional radiology? Interventional radiology has developed more and more complex procedures, and they tend to have patients with significant comorbidities and necessitate longer case durations. It is not uncommon to see interventional radiology procedures take six, eight, or even 10 hours or longer. Many anesthesiologists utilize um, general anesthesia for patients undergoing IR, uh, undergoing these procedures in IR. However, many IR procedures can be done under light or moderate sedation, and a commonly used technique for light sedation involves peripheral nerve blockade using short or long-acting local anesthetics, depending upon the procedures. Peripheral nerve blockade can obviate the need for deep sedation or general anesthesia and can be used in a variety of IR procedures, uh, which can be useful in patients who have significant cardiac disease or are otherwise hemodynamically unstable. Some of these blocks are a little unusual as well. For instance, um, uh, uh, phrenic nerve blocks can be used for CT-guided pulmonary biopsies, not a block that we would typically consider. Um, paravertebral blocks can be used in many biliary drainage procedures. Of course, other types of blocks that can be used include brachioplexus, sciatic femoral, and other commonly occurring blocks out uh, in the operating room as well. An anesthesia healthcare provider should consider many factors when creating an anesthetic plan for each patient. 
The physical arrangement of equipment in the IR suite may limit access to the patient. For example, the presence of specialized equipment may require anesthesiologists to be in an unfamiliar position relative to the patient. Procedures focused on the head or neck will also make it difficult to access the airway. The procedures may require specific patient positioning or require that the patient remains motionless throughout its duration. Ultimately, again, a discussion between the anesthesiologist and interventional radiologists is essential to minimize complication rates in IR procedures and improve patient safety. Uh, I'm gonna briefly go over the last couple that I really wanna include because I think that MR needs to be called out uh, specifically. The magnetic res resonance imaging setting presents unique challenges when compared with other neurocytes. MRI uses power powerful magnetic fields and electromagnetic waves to create detailed anatomic images of soft tissue and bony, uh, soft tissue and bony structures. The magnetic field created by the MRI machine can pull any ferromagnetic object, potentially causing injury to the patient and healthcare providers, not to mention to the machine itself, at great cost to repair. Objects located within a patient, such as ocular implants, older implanted pacemakers, or foreign bodies like shrapnel, may be moved or become heated, causing thermal injury. Therefore, additional precautions should be taken to screen patients for these objects prior to their MRI scan. Further, the electromagnetic waves have the potential to interfere with medical equipment, including most of our standard monitoring devices, as well as fluid or medication pumps, and thus should be used outside of the MR area of effect or alternative equipment must be used. Now, the practitioner may uh, elect to utilize extension tubing to run infusions from outside the MRI zone four to the patient or they may have MRI compatible pumps. However, with MRI compatible pumps, keep in mind that you must then enter the MRI suite in order to change infusion rates. In the event of a code situation, the patient should be removed from the MRI room, which is zone four, to zone three. Zone three sort of acts as a buffer zone where emergency scenarios such as collapsed airways, anaphylactic reactions, or cardiovascular compromise can be managed. Much of the necessary equipment that is not MRI safe will be located in, in zone three. Delivery of anesthesia in the MRI suite typically involves minimal sedation, though general anesthesia is often chosen as it may minimize the risk of getting a poor exam related to motion artifact. Since imaging itself is not a noxious stimulus, uh, other than the noise generated by the coils, many patients can get through a scan comfortably with light sedation. Patients who typically require anesthesia in the MRI suite may have claustrophobia, phonophobia, or an inability to remain motionless for the duration of the scan, typically due to pain. Total intravenous anesthesia can be used to obtain sedation. Light sedation can be achieved with incremental doses of midazolam or fentanyl, as well as hypnotics like propofol and or ketamine, which are equally useful in this setting. If necessary, combinations of hypnotics and uh, opioids such as running fentanyl can also be used. In cases where general anesthesia is required, induction and airway management are completed outside of the MRI suite, and the anesthesia providers move the patient into the MRI machine once the airway is secured. Regardless of the technique, anesthesia healthcare providers should have a contingency plan to address airway access in the event of respiratory complications. Uh, in the U.S., uh, and many other countries, uh, in vitro fertilization in an office setting is an increasing, um, increasingly seen procedure. Retrieval of these oocytes can be performed under paracervical, epidural, or spinal blocks, intravenous sedation, or general anesthesia. Each of those techniques has advantages and disadvantages that should be considered. Paracervical blocks can be performed with different doses of lidocaine along with some sedation. And in fact, in a randomized double-blind and placebo-controlled study, Looking at the efficacy of paracervical blocks at egg retrieval, pain scores were substantially reduced compared with placebo or no local injection. Epidural anesthesia is another effective option for egg retrieval. However, it does not improve treatment outcomes in comparison to IV sedation. Uh, intravenous sedation and general anesthesia offer anesthesiologists other techniques to ensure a successful procedure for patients. General anesthesia may make the procedure technically easier to perform for the gynecologist and more comfortable for the patient by relaxing uterine muscle tone for easier manipulation and access to the smaller ovarian follicles. However, I must point out that 
When I say general anesthesia, what I'm really referring to is general anesthesia with an unprotected airway. The potential negative effects of anesthetic agents on in vitro fertilization outcome have not been well established. Some anesthetic agents, propofol, panethol, midazolam, fentanyl, and even alfentanil, can accumulate in the follicular fluid. While this bioaccumulation is indirect index of potential toxicity, more studies need to be done to determine the likelihood of negative effects associated with these anesthetics. Ultimately, Anesthesiologists should weigh patient factors and preferences and the risks and benefits of different agents and explore the safest anesthesia plan with the gynecologists and patients. In the US, these procedures are overwhelmingly done as general anesthesia with an unprotected airway, as this tends to result in the greatest patient satisfaction faction, excuse me, and efficiency for these procedures. Uh, just to point out additional office settings, depending upon where you are, plastics, dental, and urology, Typically, in every situation I've been in, the layouts are very, very poor, require a great deal of communication, as well as uh, uh, re-education on the part of the nurses involved in the room, uh, as well as concerns for lack of pipeline oxygen, uh, lack of sufficient oxygen tanks, et cetera. Advance. Okay, so in summary, what do I wanna conclude here? So Nora is its own entity, it's its own beast, and requires thoughtful consideration of factors not necessarily present in the OR and mandates early involvement of anesthesia personnel to ensure success and safety. So, so to that end, um, anesthesiologists should get involved as early as possible in the planning of suites or in the redesigning of those suites should they be repurposed for the use of anesthesia. Um, Further, as discussed, these patients are typically older and sicker than the patients that we take care for in our more comfortable environments. Therefore, it really becomes more critical that a preoperative optimization clinic be set up to ensure that these patients are seen ahead of time and in the best possible shape prior to undergoing uh, anesthesia in these non-operative locations. As far as efficiency goes, um, Scheduling provider-specific blocks, like we would in the OR with surgeons, has been shown to dramatically improve elective uh, time in and out of blocks, uh, opportunity unused times, and increased productivity. Traditionally, these suites are not scheduled in blocks. They're typically scheduled as a first-come, first-served patient needed by whatever, whatever um, uh, procedural list. Um, more fully, Follow your ASA guidelines or your national organization if you don't if if uh, if you have uh, one to follow with appropriate guidelines and I've listed some of those on the side here. Regular training and instruction for non OR personnel again is critical. Remember these folks are not trained to deal with emergencies in the OR. While we're not technically in the OR, effectively we are. They need to understand those issues related specifically to emergencies, uh, specifically to anesthesia. Airway management is not typically their specialty. And finally, anesthesia delivery in NORA settings should be held with the same high quality standards as that within the operating room. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Here are my references. Thank you, Please Dr. Lindenbaum. That was, that was an extensive, uh, slides preparation that you did and it's a great talk uh, i'm sure there will be questions at the end so please hang on let's move on to the next uh, speaker now uh, which is going to be anesthesia for gi endoscopy uh, that will be dr baswana gaudra he's uh, well known throughout the world as an expert in the field of gi endoscopy and sedation anesthesia published extensively on this topic. He is an associate professor of anesthesia and critical care at the University of Pennsylvania, one of my alma maters. And I'm glad that he's able to share his extensive knowledge with us in talking about anesthesia for GI procedures. Hello, everyone. My yes. name is Dr. Gowdra, one of the anesthesiologists at the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, been practicing here for almost 15 years, and one of the very few who exclusively work in J endoscopy anesthesia, that's all I do, uh, both 
freestanding endoscopy unit and hospital attached endoscopy unit in action um, with the FDA uh, participate in some of their meetings. Over 100 procedures uh, in eight rooms with the eight nurse anesthesiologists. Right. And uh, the number of procedures is more than number of patients because many patients get more than one procedure, endoscopy and a colonoscopy. When I say endoscopy, I mean esophageal, gastro, duodenoscopy, or EGD in short. In the rest of the hospital, obviously the names are all blurred, uh, so that one can't read what exactly they are. In 29 rooms, we performed only 43 procedures uh, with you know, lots of nurse anesthetists, attending anesthesiologists. And some of the cases, in fact, went late in the evening and some in the night as well. In terms of uh, terms, uh, types of procedures, uh, elective procedures are performed in hospital, hospital attached uh, endoscopy outpatient unit and in freestanding units. And the freestanding units don't do any advanced procedures like ERCP, UES, endopediatrics, endoscopic submucosal dissection, submucosal resection, or, or oral endoscopy myotomy. These are all performed in the hospital attached endoscopy unit where I spend predominantly uh, my time. And uh, in patient facility, uh, part of the endoscopy, uh, sorry, of the hospital, where we do endoscopic procedures, takes care of emergencies, including bleeding, whether they're diagnostic, therapeutic, or whether G obstruction or uh, your uh, biliary obstruction. And as I said, we have one, two, three, four, five places where we do endoscopic procedures. Two are part of the main hospital. One is hospital attached outpatient facility, and the other two are three standing units, which are out of the hospital reach. The backup, if something goes wrong, is to call the ambulance using 911. <clears throat> and what kind of sedations these patients get? In our hospital, we used to do a lot of these procedures under what's called conscious sedation, which is Midazolam and fentanyl, maybe some Benadryl administered by the nurses under the supervision of the gastroenterologist. And that trend continued for many years, uh, but beginning in 2007 8, as you can see, the increasing width of the yellow bar there, the procedures that are performed under what we call MAC anesthesia are propofol based deep sedation without a airway, a, a definitive airway. Uh, became the standard, and by around 2013 and 2014, pretty much all patients were being done under deep sedation with propofol, unless patient requested either to be awake or wanted conscious sedation. And the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be discussing what's called rule-based practice. And these rules are evidence-based. It's not that I didn't make them up, uh, but you know, given my extensive research and practical experience in this field, I discuss uh, uh, ways to increase the safety of J endoscopy and assistive practice, uh, both in my hospital and outside, including in the American Society of Anesthesia annual meetings and worldwide. There's very little time to do a detailed pre-procedural evaluation in these patients. As a result, we need to intelligently use the time that's available and focus on two biggest risk factors which these patients uh, experience. One is aspiration and another is uh, hypoxemia. How do you anticipate aspiration? Well, if the patient has a history of aspiration pneumonia, if the patient needs to you know, sit up 30 degrees, prop up in order to sleep, uh, if they regurgitate, if they have uh, severe degree of uh, achalasia, uh, then yes, the risk of aspiration is higher. And risk of hypoxemia, yeah, is, it could be either morbid obesity, you know, sleep apnea, interstitial lung disease, big time smoker, uh, history of COPD, emphysema. These are all the pointers towards hypoxemia. And as I said, studies have shown, whether it is uh, in the USA or outside USA, that aspiration is a common risk factor, especially in patients undergoing colonoscopy. It is a a less of a problem if the patient is undergoing both uh, EGD and colonoscopy because EGD is always, always performed first. And we have an opportunity to see what's in the esophagus and stomach if it's liquid, we aspirate it out or suck it out. And uh, if it is in a semi solid, then obviously the procedure will get cancelled. 
And uh, <clears throat> if it is easily alone, obviously it is less of a problem. And data from Ontario, yeah, again, increased risk of aspiration pneumonia in patients undergoing colonoscopy. Data from WashU, this is somewhat an old data, but nothing much has changed in terms of risk of aspiration and hypoxemia. These patients undergoing advanced endoscopic procedures had 33% risk of hypoxemia, saturation below 90%, and some degree of aspiration. Data from Harvard, as you can see, patients undergoing max sedation, uh, as highlighted by the, the, the green uh, stuff here, uh, higher incidence of, incidence of uh, desaturation below 85%, and the need for unexpected uh, either mask ventilation or intubation, where the patient undergoing general anesthesia had higher incidence of cardiac arrhythmias and need for vasopressor use, you know, which is not hard to foresee. In our own hospital, we had an incidence of cardiac arrest in patients undergoing endo uh, endoscopic procedures, about four per 10,000, and this occurred in patients predominantly ASA3 and not necessarily in morbidly obese patients. Most of the patients, in fact, had the BMI less than 30. Main reason for hypoxemia is obviously drugs. Propofol, which we administer, and the fentanyl, which we typically use to supplement sedation with propofol, especially in patients with irritable airway, are undergoing advanced procedures, you know, EGDs, in comparison to propofol, uh, sorry, in comparison to colonoscopy where uh, the aim of uh, the sedation or the depth of sedation we aim at is to maintain spontaneous ventilation, obviously in both inertia and preserve the laryngeal reflex in colonoscopy. So it is lighter degree. So that in case the patient brings out anything, they'll be able to protect their when coffee tab. We don't always get it right, but by and large we do. Whereas in endoscopy is the aim of uh, uh, the degree of sedation that's aimed at is to suppress the laryngeal drip so that when the scope is being introduced, patient don't cough and as a result have problems like desaturation because of coughing, laryngeal passive breath, or things like that. The second rule is always titrate. It is a tightrope walk sedating these patients with propofol. If, as I said, if I err on uh, an over sedation, patients will have apnea, hypopnea, and desaturation that way. If you err on the underside, then you have problem with breath holding, uh, uh, laryngospasm, and coughing. And uh, why do sedatives cause hypoxia in some and not in others? Because of PKPD variability. Uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic variability. Propofol alone has about 300% variability. And if you add fentanyl, it adds another 100%. Another so 400% variability is a, is a big factor. And we know that uh, because, you know, these patients, this is a study which I did uh, many years ago. Uh, and what we did here was, uh, at that time, we were using both what I described, conscious sedation with nurses administering uh, midazolam and fentanyl under the direction of the gastroenterologist with no anesthesia provider present there, whether it's a nurse anesthetist or uh, physician anesthesiologist. And what we found here, patients, <clears throat> when the CRNS were blinded to the degree of uh, depth of sedation as monitored by SEDLINE, which is a, a brain function monitor made by Massimo, more than half the time, these patients were under general anesthesia. So, Majority of the time, these patients are under general anesthesia without a protected airway. And a way of addressing variability is to use infusion pumps. And the infusions can be given by manual infusion pumps, automated infusion pumps, which use TCA models. And I really don't recommend intermittent manual bolus unless the procedure is extremely quick. You understand your GA doctor well. And patient control sedation came into being, you know, they were part go to replace anesthesia providers. The sedesis was the, uh, the big one among them, made by Johnson & Johnson, but you know, it died a quick death, not even slow death. Uh, typically, we administer a bolus of anywhere between you know, 20 to 200, depending on anticipated need of propofol. Age is a big factor if the patient is certainly 70, 80, 90. The requirement of propofol is extremely small, even with something like 20, 30 milligrams, they can go to apnea and desaturation. Whereas somebody young, healthy, you know, typically marijuana smokers require higher degrees of pro, uh, 
a higher amount of propofol might even require 200 milligram bolus, even 100 to 200 milligram fentanyl, plus infusion rates, even say 200, 300 milligram per microgram per kilo per minute. Otherwise, generally, you require something like 100 to 150. This patient is getting 125 mic per kilo per minute. One of my friends giving uh, uh, propofol remifentanil with TCI devices in England for myotomy for Zenkus diverticulum. Remifentanil targeted at three nanogram per cc and propofol targeted one microgram per cc. And even uh, TCI devices, uh, target control infusion, administration of propofol does have side effects, it's not that they don't. Uh, including desaturation, requirement of vasoactives, hypotension, desaturation, uh, both below 90%, 95%, and need for advanced airway management, whether it is oral airway, nasal airway, mask ventilation, or even intubation. It happens in both in non-advanced and advanced procedures. And as far as monitoring is concerned, please, please, please use saturation, rely on saturation. However, be aware of its major limitation. What's the major limitation? <clears throat> Here, I'm showing oxygen dissociation curve, the typical sigmoid uh, shaped curve here. Oxygen saturation will be above 100% once the arterial tension is about 120 plus. And even when the arterial tension is, say, 650, 700, saturation is still 100%. There's nothing beyond 100% we can measure. That's one of the major drawbacks. Why? Because all patients have what's called apnea, safe apnea time. I don't know whether we call it safe apnea time in the context of J-endoscopy sedation. Because patients can take even in you know, 10, 11 minutes for the tension to fall from 700 to down to say 100, when the saturation is start going below 100. However, in a patient undergoing endoscopy, that patient would have been either apneic or hypopneic for a significant period of time before reflected by the pulse oximeter. So the time to intervene is not when the saturation hit 90, uh, 95, because by, from that point onwards, they fall very rapidly. Uh, it is when the patient is already apneic or hypopneic because of sedation. So one way, one I can, either one can provide you know, chin lift, jaw thrust to open the airways, to stimulate the patient. So that the spontaneous ventilation is re-established or spontaneous ventilation gets better, uh, or pause the uh, infusions. Uh, but even even if they don't work, have a low threshold for asking the gastroenterologist with scope, use your mask ventilation and address the hypoxemia. And occasionally you have patients going to laryngospasm, you know, it doesn't matter how careful you are, always have a loaded syringe of succinyl choline. And obviously if the patient is MH susceptible, have uh, rocuronium available. Why there is hypoxemia? Yeah, I mentioned two things. One is the central respiratory depression. And the second is peripheral airway collapse. The soft tissues, which are non, which are collapsible segment with non-collapsible segment either side, is going to collapse under the influence of sedation. And when uh, and the patient start breathing even harder to address that, then because of the venturi effect, the collapsible segment further collapses, as you can see in this figure. And this is one of the picture I took by introducing a tiny scope through the nose while the endoscopy was going on with the mouth. In this patient, you can see a laryngeal inlet wide open, whereas in this patient, you don't see anything. So morbid lobe is patient, tons of redundant tissue, that's a problem. As I mentioned, often simple maneuvers, neck extension, jaw thrust, and chin lift, that's all it's required, provided you apply it intelligently, judiciously at the right time. Most important is to use it at the right time. Uh, in addition, pretty much all of our patients undergoing advanced endoscopic procedures, barring those who require endoscopic submucosal dissection, which all get general anesthesia or paroral endoscopy myotomy, they all get general anesthesia, but patients undergoing ERCP, endoscopic ultrasound, even in semi-prone position, they get critically uh, this uh, kind of uh, airway support. So a nasal uh, pharyngeal airway is introduced through the nose or nasal trumpet popularly known as, 
connected to a EG tube adapter, the outlet, typically a nine size EG tube adapter goes to a 32 or 34 nasal trumpet so friend size, whereas eight is enough for 28, connected with the elbow connector to a maple cell separating system, which is uh, where the oxygen runs anywhere between and then 12 to 15 liters per minute or even higher. Yes, we give dry gases, but these are quick procedures, short procedures. And this does you know, multiple purposes. One, it provides 100% oxygen to the laryngeal inlet, where it really matters. By increasing the flow, you increase the oxygen uh, and amount of gas at the laryngeal inlet, providing some degree of CPAP, because everything can't escape so easily. And by providing some degree of CPAP, you increase the oxygenation, provide um, and maintain the FRC. And most importantly, if needed, one can further increase the flow, close the valve, and even provide a degree of positive pressure ventilation. It's not very effective, but good enough to uh, uh, bring up the oxygen. And at least in this patient, you don't always see this kind of monitor picture there, but you can see beautiful entire carbon dioxide tracing, which is being sampled at the filter. Same thing being done in another patient, done in a morbidly obese patient. Of course, there are various devices that are being manufactured and constantly marketed, including my own, which is still not available. And have a plan to deal with adverse events. As I said, these adverse events can happen in a most unexpected time, not necessarily in you know, patients with high BMI and not necessarily those, those with you know, sleep apnea, maybe because we are already proactive and doing everything to reduce the risk in these patients. Many times they happen in patients AC3, AC2, you know, you don't expect those things to happen because you know you haven't probably take all precautions or maybe casual about it. We have a cell phone. Uh, cell phone uh, dedicated in our uh, center uh, between two anesthesiologists. One of us carry a dedicated cell phone, which can be reached very quickly by press of one button from any room. And we don't even wait to answer the call. We just rush to the room because we know what's happening there. There should be a cardiac, cardiac arrest plan, including availability of a defibrillator. And, uh, and we are fortunate to have a rapid response team, which will come, uh, you know, uh, for fine the team and they come with their own uh, pharmacy help and airway help, uh, things like that, so that the patient can be transferred after they're stabilized to the ED. Rule seven, if in doubt, intubate. Whether it's before the procedure, you know, if you, if you anticipate airway difficulties or if you anticipate uh, aspiration risk, just intubate. It's such, so much easier to intubate these patients than struggling to, uh, you know, take care of the patient when they start troubling you. Of course, even during the procedure, if you have a problem, have no threshold intubate. There are, however, some absolute indications like large pseudocyst of the pancreas, gastric outlet obstruction, suspected full stomach or ongoing GI bleeding. These are all indications for intubating this patient. There are, of course, some relative indications, and these are the intubation guidelines in our hospital. Lastly, the last rule is have a dedicated pool of anesthesia providers. Uh, don't be under the impression, you know, these are silly, simple endoscopy, colonoscopy procedures. Now, um, there's nothing like, you know, to quote uh, Dr. Tosha, one of the anesthesiologists popular from Manipal uh, in the uh, uh, 90s, there are minor surgeries, but there are no minor anesthetics. When you think something is very silly, simple, yes, cardiac arrest can happen, patients can die, and unfortunately, implications of death you know, in such a case are far more significant than somebody dying, you know, because of a complicated cardiac or neurosurgery. So have a dedicated pool of anesthesia providers, whether it's nurse anesthetist or anesthesia attendings, because I've shown in my own study, using a dedicated pool of providers, you increase the efficiency, you increase the safety. And in this study, at least we showed that de dedicated providers intubated more patients because they have seen the risk, they've seen the complications, they know which patients require more attention. And finally, to recapture the whole thing, in the history, focus on aspiration and hypoxemia, always titrate, use infusion pumps, rely on saturation, however, be aware of its biggest limitation, which is it doesn't track the arterial oxygen tension. And even if you have nothing in the room, have some airway equipment available, have a breathing system connected to the oxygen and a syringe of suction and colon, be ready to treat the adverse events at a moment's notice. If in doubt, 
intubate, intubate in advance, have a dedicated pool of anesthesia providers. That will come conclude my talk. Again, thank Indian College of Anesthesiology for organizing this beautiful webinar. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gaudra. Uh, that was wonderful. And uh, the next speaker is Dr. Anna Swenson, and she's one of my colleagues. Okay. And she's an assistant professor in our department of anesthesiology, and she's the director of our sedation unit. And she coordinates the morbidity and mortality conferences every Tuesday. And uh, she has been recognized as a as a clinical excellent honorary by our practice plan at the university. Her interests are pediatric ambulatory anesthesia, thromboelastography, and QI and Q improvement. Uh, welcome, Dr. Swenson. Thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Balani, and also for uh, your uh, guidance and mentorship at the beginning of my career. Uh, so I'll be talking about anesthesia for outpatient pediatric GI procedures today. I hope to focus more on the children and not and add upon uh, Dr. Gouda's excellent talk. So um, some objectives will be to be able to list the frequent complications of pediatric endoscopic procedures, to be able to assess the patient procedure and facility needs as they impact the anesthetic plan, and then to formulate anesthetic plans for uh, pediatric endoscopy patients. I don't have any financial disclosures. So first, uh, what are the common pediatric GI procedures? Uh, they can undergo most things that adults can undergo. Uh, most commonly are upper endoscopies and colonoscopies, with some patients undergoing more advanced procedures such as ERCP. Upper and uh, lower endoscopies can be diagnostic or therapeutic. Uh, common upper endoscopy therapeutic uh, procedures where we're especially, um, that especially impact our anesthetic plans are uh, foreign body retrievals, variceal bandings, uh, dilations, and uh, dressing sources of bleeding. <clears throat> so I put best in quotation marks here because there's no best anesthetic plan for everyone. Uh, we need to individualize it uh, based on the factors for the patient, the procedure, and the facility. First, um, identifying uh, patient factors that impact our anesthetic plan. Uh, some pediatric patients have uh, quite a bit of anxiety around the procedure, and that will impact how you prepare them and how you get them uh, ready for the procedure. In addition, for pediatric patients, you not only have to uh, address the patient's anxiety, but also the, the families. The age of the patient is important uh, mainly because of their uh, size and the scope to uh, airway ratio, which greatly can impact um, the ability to oxygenate and ventilate. Also the patient's weight and BMI, and of course other medical conditions that uh, increase their aspiration risk, such as gastroesophageal reflux, frequent vomiting, uh, bleeding, et cetera and uh, pulmonary disease that may impact their oxygenation and ventilation, including uh, upper respiratory infection. Children uh, commonly have upper respiratory infections, uh, especially in our population during the winter that uh, greatly increase their uh, airway reflexes. Um, also, uh, patients may have obstructive sleep apnea, uh, not only because of their uh, BMI factors, but also in children because of their uh, large tonsils that tend to peak in uh, late toddler, early elementary school ages. And also if they have any other chronic respiratory conditions uh, requiring medications as we often see with asthma or former prematurity, any other airway or cardiovascular concerns. Um, as with all patients, we do a thorough preoperative evaluation 
But as we're focused on the airway, because those are most of our uh, complications that are, have to do with the airway in upper endoscopies, at least, uh, we'll have a thorough airway history and exam, and then ask those questions uh, about factors that may increase airway reactivity, such as a recent URI. Uh, within even several weeks, it increases the airway reflexes, asthma, um, any smoking or exposure to smoking. And then as well as with any patients asking about their anesthetic history and PO status, allergies, medications, and other pathology and organ function. It's also important to know uh, why they are doing the procedure. Uh, sometimes it can be quite illustrative of a potential aspiration risks if the patient has a lot of difficulty swallowing or uh, severe GERD or frequent vomiting may be a case where you'd want to more uh, completely protect the airway with intubation. So uh, we've considered our patient factors, now we need to consider our procedure-related factors. <clears throat> what intervention is planned? What size of scope is needed? Uh, what's the potential for bleeding and obstruction? <clears throat> the size of scope greatly varies uh, uh, from their small uh, ultra slim scopes, which can be under five millimeters, to their uh, larger adult size uh, interventional scopes, which can be well over 10 millimeters. And so uh, it's important to uh, assess the size of the scope that they're going to use in your patient's airway to see how much uh, external obstruction will be uh, needed during the procedure and, if in doubt, intubate. You can also uh, assess the proceduralist experience, uh, not only with um, endoscopy in general, but in this patient population, uh, procedures are often more uh, smooth. And uh, if the proceduralist has specific experience with children. So the uh, facility factors that may impact your anesthetic approach um, as uh, Dr. Lindenbaum was saying, often uh, facilities very much prize efficiency, uh, which increases, which increase their uh, profits. Uh, so ideally, the anesthetic would have a fast onset with little preparation of the the patient and uh, materials. Have minimal interruptions for your proceduralists. Have a fast offset so the patient can be discharged quickly, and the um, the facility and uh, your colleagues would have experience with the, the method to increase its safety. Also, cost is a factor of your uh, airway equipment, your medications, and uh, everything else you're using in your anesthetic plan. It's also important to uh, assess the availability of monitoring if you're going to be using a deep or uh, general anesthesia and of trained availability of trained staff and of your medications that you're planning on and your uh, rescue medications if you might need them. So it, when uh, planning your anesthetic approach, uh, it's important to think of what might go wrong. So the most common uh, complications for uh, endoscopies, especially upper endoscopies in children, are uh, usually um, related to the airway. And so they can be broken into uh, desaturations and uh, aspirations. Uh, desaturations can happen from a host of uh, causes, including uh, apnea and hypoventilation, which is usually from your uh, sedation medications. It can happen from obstruction, either the patient's um, redundant tissue or uh, a larger scope than um, the patient's airway can tolerate and uh, from bronco and laryngospasm from uh, your airway uh, reflexes. And aspiration can happen either with the, the risk factors that we've discussed prior, or sometimes it is a unwelcome surprise. And then other complications, anytime we do anesthesia, there's the possibility for allergies, malignant hyperthermia, hypothermia, cardiovascular instability, um, and then also with these procedures, there is, if the patient is uh, inadequately sedated, they may ex uh, experience some emotional distress, 
And especially in pediatric patients, they have a higher rate of emergence, delirium, and agitation. Uh, Procedure-related complications are thankfully uh, less common for the more severe ones, including bleeding and perforation, but mucosal, dental, and positioning uh, injuries happen more commonly. So uh, the gears of your anesthetic uh, plan, uh, we will talk about the steps to prepare the patient, um, choosing a targeted sedation level, uh, choosing your airway management plan, and then which medications. So for preparation of the patient, communication is exceedingly critical. Um, you have both the patient and their family who uh, you need to um, prepare so that they uh, smoothly undergo their uh, procedure and are don't experience the emotional distress or at least as little as you can have. Uh, so it's important to set the child and family expectations, which starts in the GI office. Uh, and uh, we try to uh, encourage our providers to avoid setting an inflexible plan before the day of the procedure. If you have a family who thinks that they will be put completely to sleep and you don't think that's safe, then um, they may be uh, upset. And so it's good to keep it um flexible so that you can evaluate the patient on the day of the procedure. And medical play can be quite helpful for children, um, playing with IVs uh, without the needles um, and uh, showing them pictures of the room can ease their anxiety. And then uh, considering pre-medications, both uh, for anxiety and then also to decrease airway reactivity uh, is an important part of preparing uh, your patient. And then there's the consideration of a parent present induction, whether you'll uh, have the parent be present for before the child uh, begins the procedure. So um, there's been a lot written on anxiolytic medications, whether they which ones are better and whether they delay uh, discharge time. Uh, common medications are oral midazolam, ketamine, and dexmedetomidine. Um, most commonly used is the oral midazolam. However, there are children that require a higher level of sedation to even move them from one place to another, uh, or patients who won't take oral midazolam. And they, there are alternatives as well. Uh, midazolam can be given um, intramuscularly as well. And so pre-medications to decrease airway reactivity. Um, we talked in the pre-op assessment about uh, asking about factors that may increase the patient's airway reactivity, including recent URIs uh, and asthma, including recent asthma exacerbations. Um, we commonly give albuterol if the patient has had um, a recent upper respiratory infection, definitely within the past uh, couple of weeks, but also out to about six weeks, they can maintain their airway reactivity. If the uh, case is elective and uh, the patient has an active uh, URI, especially with the high risk signs of fever, wheezing or difficulty breathing or an uh, purulent sputum, uh, we do delay, consider delaying the case in uh, communication with our GI proceduralist. Then, uh, there's the uh, topical local anesthetic, which we found quite helpful in uh, older cooperative children, as in uh, the adult literature, for uh, decreasing their uh, gag and cough reflex with the insertion of the scope. It's important to be mindful of the amount of topical local anesthetic to avoid local anesthetic toxicity. So the, our approach to preparing the patient uh, it very much centers on advanced communication. There's a phone call before the patient arrives and also they com have communication in the GI office. Um, we have the default of a peripheral IV placement. If the patient has difficult access or has a severe needle phobia, uh, we also can uh, do mask inductions. Uh, the patient has their choice of local anesthetic for the peripheral IV placement and we commonly don't use oral midazolam uh, 
because we have very experienced child life uh, specialists who work the work with the child and family to place the peripheral IV, but we do need it on occasion. And then we topicalize the uh, older child's oropharynx right before we head back uh, to the procedure room. Then we use uh, an occasional uh, IV dose of anxiolysis at the time of transport if needed. And we bring the parents with us, which it has seemed to be a lower, um, anxi it lowers anxiety perhaps even more than the IV anxiolysis. Um, this approach apply, uh, is only uh, workable with our child life specialists and experienced nurses. Um, they are very good at getting IVs in children and um, it doesn't require uh, too much prep time. Uh, they arrive about an hour before their procedure with this experienced staff. So next, um, after we've prepared our patient, we need to uh, have our targeted sedation level. As is discussed with uh, adults, they often tolerate mild to moderate sedation, especially uh, for lower endoscopies. Uh, many providers are uh, comfortable providing this um, as it provides uh, cardiopulmonary stability and it requires less equipment and monitoring for patient safety because they maintain their airway uh, reflexes. There's possibly a faster recovery. Um, <clears throat> however, for children, it can be quite traumatic and it's not accepted, at least in our patient population, by parents and children as a plan, uh, as recall is more likely. Also, with children, there's not really the as much of the concept of um, conscious sedation, because if the young child is conscious, they're not going to want to cooperate with the procedure, and there's more patient movement, and not uh, which delays the procedure. However, always with mild to moderate sedation, there's the possibility of getting a deeper level of sedation when the patient is moving and they get more and more, and uh, then needing uh, airway intervention that you might not be prepared for. So for uh, children in our patient population, except for extremely motivated older teenagers, we use deep sedation uh, or general anesthesia. This pro uh, provides the uh, proceduralist minimal patient movement. It's much more acceptable for the patient and uh, family, and the patient doesn't have as much of a risk of recall or, or trauma from the procedure. However, it does require more monitoring uh, and equipment for safe uh, use. Uh, there's more of a possibility of respiratory and cardiovascular instability that you might need to intervene on. Um, and possibly a longer recovery time. Uh, so there's a great variation in anesthetic approach. I'll uh, later speak to what uh, we do in our practice, but there is very much a lack of established uh, best practice as our patients are uh, quite individualized. Um, Harshes et al. Uh, looked at about 260 anesthetic records of children at their uh, institution in uh, Massachusetts. They gave almost 30 different sedation regimens for uh, upper and lower endoscopies. Most were a native airway uh, with the intubations being in younger patients, higher ASA status patients, and upper endoscopy, as you might imagine, for having that higher scope to airway ratio. And um, they found that there was a longer anesthetic time with uh, intubation. Um, and most had a propofol infusion. And bringing us to which uh, medications do you use for deep sedation? Most commonly we use propofol so, uh, and adjuncts in, that you can use with the propofol are benzodiazepine, opioids, dexmedetomidine, and ketamine. Ketamine has the drawback of increasing your oral secretions, which uh, can be problematic if you're trying to maintain an, uh, a native airway. Propofol can be given as a bolus and or infusion. We recommend an infusion unless it's a very, very short procedure. Uh, Dysma and all randomized 240 children for endoscopy with propofol alone or with fentanyl or midazolam. And they found fewer uh, complications, which were mostly uh, desaturations when adjuncts were used. Uh, interestingly, they had very short procedures, uh, about seven to eight minutes, and uh, they had similar procedure times and recovery times, whether there were adjuncts or not, 
However, there was a trend for um, longer procedure time, but shorter recovery time with the propofol alone. Um, there's been uh, some uh, reports of sevoflurane being used for um, upper endoscopies. Um, we use it mostly when the patient's intubated. Uh, there have been reports of pe people using it to get the patient very deep and then quickly doing an endoscopy. Uh, this has the drawbacks of having a great amount of environmental and staff exposure and higher rates of emergence, delirium, and nausea uh, with just sevoflurane. And as you might imagine, titration would be very difficult during an under, upper endoscopy without a uh, secured airway in place. Bringing us to our airway management for children undergoing uh, endoscopies. Um, as you can see, the pediatric airway is quite different than the adult airway, and it's important to keep track of these uh, be mindful of these changes when you're making your airway plan for children undergoing endoscopies. Children have larger heads and longer, larger tongues, which uh, lead to greater uh, obstruction, especially when the shoulder roll isn't placed behind the, the child's shoulders. Um, you can see some nasal congestion. Children have frequent upper respiratory infections that increase their airway reactivity. And you can see this child has quite large tonsils, which, uh, increase um, upper airway obstruction as well. Options for airway management include nasal cannula, high flow nasal cannula, face mask as, but just for colonoscopy uh, or intubation. <clears throat> So there's been a lot of excitement about high flow nasal cannula. Uh, in the adult literature, it's shown fewer uh, desaturations uh, across a range of fields of medicine uh, in many conditions, including um, periprocedurally, especially for high risk patients. Uh, there are fewer pediatric studies. Um, Charulon et al. randomized children undergo undergoing bronchoscopies and uh, that group found that there was less mild to moderate hypoxemia, but no difference in severe, severe hypoxemia uh, with the high flow nasal cannula. There were uh, fewer desaturations with lavage with the high flow nasal cannula, which is a higher risk situation um, for desaturations. Klotz et al. Uh, randomized 50 children undergoing specifically upper endoscopy, um, but they did not find any difference in respiratory events. However, this was a small pilot study, and when their groups were randomized, they weren't equal in their predisposing factors. There was both more smoke exposure and snoring in the high flow nasal cannula group, so it's difficult to draw conclusions uh, from uh, this study. It may be that um, as in adults, the high flow nasal cannula can be more uh, helpful for patients who are at high risk for desaturations. Um, also, there is the possibility of intubating your patient um, and protecting their airway. Uh, so intubation, we use to decrease their aspiration risk if the patient has uh, predisposing factors such as vomiting or severe GERD, or if the procedure has elevated risk such as blanding, uh, bleeding, or, or also patients who aren't NPO. Uh, Intubation also can allow respiration by uh, re decreasing the impact of obstruction. Um, patients who are small and young uh, and patients who have uh, sleep apnea or other airway abnormalities or who are going interventions um, with larger scopes. Also patients who may have baseline respiratory insufficiency or concerns that you don't think it would be uh, effective to just use high flow nasal cannula. Intubation um, in our practice has increases anesthetic time. Uh, we usually do awake extubations because often we're um, intubating for uh, airway obstruction um, or uh, elevated aspiration risk. However, Patino and all did a study that randomized 180 children to be intubated. Um, intubated with SIBO for their procedure, intubated with propofol for their endoscopy or a native airway. And they found more desaturations and more inadequate uh, anesthesia with the native airway group. They had the same perioperative time. However, all their uh, children were um, 
induced with sevoflurane, which uh, adds some uh, time to the procedure, regardless of whether they do a native airway or intubation. Uh, and they, it seems like they were all extubated deep, which um, raises the issue of perhaps the patient will have their aspiration or obstruction in the recovery area that would wasn't reported um, in the study because it didn't look like they um, commented on any PACU complications. So our approach to the anesthetic for a children um, undergoing upper endoscopy, we uh, usually give one milligram per kilogram of lidocaine, less if we've topicalized the airway, and then uh, propofol uh, about two to two and a half milligrams per kilogram bolus as our pediatric uh, dosing. Younger children often need a little bit more and older children or children with conditions such as sleep apnea, we would use less. Then we start our propofol infusion at 250 to 300 mics per kilo per minute. Again, these are pediatric doses, it'd be very high for adults. And then uh, we give the patient um, jaw thrust to simulate the level of uh, stimulation for um, inserting the scope and we give a additional bolus of a half to one milligram per kilogram uh, as needed to uh, until this uh, res their response um, lessens and we think they'll be able to get the scope in. We use adjuncts as indicated, not as a matter of routine. If the patient is kind of on that high end of the variability, as Dr. Gauda mentioned, they're closer to that 300%, uh, then we will uh, give them um, some Prestidex, uh, about quarter to half mics per kilogram. Also, we get that if they're anxious, uh, or we'll use fentanyl if a painful intervention is planned or if they seem to have higher propofol requirements. Uh, we, of course, have our uh, full ASA monitors and the routinely use nasal cannula oxygen with um, end tidal monitoring. Uh, in patients who have a compromised pulmonary uh, function preoperatively, um, we, we sometimes try the high flow nasal uh, cannula oxygen if they don't have other risk factors for aspiration or, um, or obstruction. And then we have our rescue medis medications, anesthesia machine, suction, and everything we need to intubate if needed as a rescue approach. <clears throat> So in conclusion, it's important to individualize the anesthetic approach for our heterogeneous pediatric population undergoing uh, different endoscopic procedures. There is an increased concern for hypoxic for hypoxia in these cases with a shared pediatric airway, um, both because of the size of the patient and the differences in the pediatric airway, uh, both anatomically and with their uh, re higher reactivity. And communication is critical amongst members of the team to uh, adequately, to make a safe anesthetic plan and adequately prepare your patient and their family for it. Thank you very much uh, to the ICA for uh, this wonderful webinar and the whole series. Thank you to Dr. Balani and my colleagues at the University of Minnesota Department of Anesthesiology and at the sedation unit, including the gastroenterology colleagues. And then thank you to my family, especially my children who have their pictures in the presentation. Um, here are some references. And then I'll be happy to take questions during the question section. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Swenson, for pointing out some of the differences between children and adults. As we all know, the procedures now increasing in frequency as it has been in adults. And uh, with that, I'm sure there'll be some questions uh, later. So to go a little bit, uh, we have been doing this uh, talk today and we need to know how do we monitor quality because that's something that most places need to do. Doesn't matter whether you're doing these cases in the operating room or non-operating room area. So we're glad to have Dr. Shamanta Reddy, who's from Montefiore Medical Center at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She's an attending anesthesiologist for more than 20 years, and she's the chief of the division of OB anesthesia and has been the past director of QI and patient safety for more than seven years. And she's a delegate to the New York State Society of Anesthesiologists and is an assistant secretary at the District 3 
of the New York State Society of Anesthesiologists. Welcome, uh, Dr. Reddy, and we would like to hear your thoughts on QI and patient safety. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Dr. Balani. Um, uh, so far, every talk has been so great, and I hope uh, to give some shed some light on quality improvement and patient safety. My disclosures are on this slide. I'm a, a primary investigator for principal investigator for my site for a NIH funded study using ketamine, and I was on the advisory board for fibrinogen, uh, either one of which I'm not going to mention today in my talk. You guys see the slides, okay? Okay, yeah. so my first, uh, you know, I want to start the talk with the example of a case. So this is a healthy 28-year-old woman, Gravida 1 Para 0, it's her first baby, comes into the OB um, LND floor and asks for a neuraxial anesthesia. And had a successful combined spinal epidural. And as soon as the spinal went in, when they lied her down, the blood pressure went down to 60 over 40 and the fetal heart rate was dangerously going down. So anesthesia resident reaches into the epidural cart and gives two ml of phenylephrine. And immediately the blood pressure comes up to 190 over 110 and patient becomes apneic and a code was called. Um, patient was ventilated using a bag mask ventilation and, you know, they achieved the 100% oxygen and the attending anesthesiologist was about to intubate the patient and the patient started moving. So I know it's an, if it's an interactive section, I would have asked what's going on, but let me tell you what happened. So the resident thought that she was taking phenylephrine and instead gave 2 ml of succinylcholine by mistake. And that's why the patient became apneic and she couldn't move. She was paralyzed and her blood pressure was so dangerously high for a young, healthy woman. So that's a traumatic experience, right? And why do these things happen? No matter where we go, you know, I grew up in India where we heard Vaidyo Narayano Hari, um, meaning that a physician is a form of God. We're not in it to make money, but we are in it to help people. And even on the West where we take, we all took an oath, right? To do no harm. And um, so why do these things happen? And it, is it just this particular resident that made a mistake? Not really. This is a landmark publication. To err is a human, to err is human, building a safer healthcare system. It's like a 300 page document released by the Institution of Medicine. And it was in 2000. Its landmark publication said that about uh, 50 to 98,000 hospitalized patients die each year because of medical errors. And where do these errors occur? They occur in intensive care units, operating rooms, and emergency departments. So hospitals are hazardous to your health sometimes. And if you look at deeper into where these errors are happening, their technical errors are 44%, but their drug errors are 10%, right? So this is how it's, um, it's like distributed. So again, after that landmark publication, when things were made heard in Congress and everything, you think we do better, but not really. In 2016, British Medical Journal came up with this publication. This is again CDC's numbers. Medical error was third most common cause of death in United States, according to CDC in that year. And it's third to heart disease and cancer. And the, and the deaths by medical errors are more than motor vehicle accidents, firearms, suicides, and even COPD, like when you combine them. So it is significant and um, we need to do something about it, right? And like I said, about 10% of them are medication errors, right? So in 2005, they still had a 1.3 million people that are injured each year, not getting better, any better in the next year. Institution of Medicine came up in 2006 that we are paying about 3.5 billion in extra medical cards, costs just because of medication errors. And it's about 1.5 million Americans that are um, harmed because of this. So I'm talking about US, but what's happening in the world, right? This is American, um, World Health Organization. Um, this is a statement in September of 2019. And 
mentions that low and middle income countries about 134 million adverse events, and that's about 2.6 million deaths. The important thing is that up to 80% of them, um, we could have prevented these errors. So maybe some countries are not even measuring because when I looked at the top 10 reasons for death in other countries, some of them don't even have medical errors in these as their cause of death. So they must be happening, but maybe they're not measuring it. So what's happening in our field in anesthesiology? Um, when they surveyed um, ASA members, uh, and they asked like, what are the top 10 reasons of uh, patient safety issues that you perceive are patient safety issues? These 10 came as uh, top. So difficult airway ma management, production pressures, uh, non-operating room anesthesia was number three. Um, office anesthesia was four. Like our colleagues just have mentioned what challenges entail when you're trying to give anesthesia outside the operating room. Neurologic deficit, coronary artery disease, occupational stress, anesthesiologist fatigue, medication errors, and time available for pre-operative uh, pre evaluation. So these all became the 10 out of the 53 that they had. So changing gears a little bit, what do we do about it, right? I'm all talking about the problem, but what we do about it. So this is Dr. Lucian Leap. He's a professor and a physician at Harvard um, who said that the single greatest impediment to error prevention in the medical industry is that we punish people for making mistakes. And we have some myths about it. So the myth number one is that if you try hard enough, you're gonna get it right, but that's not true, right? And if you punish people when they make mistakes, they make fear of them, that's not true either. So what can we do? So he said that we need to make system changes and have obstacles placed so that people make less mistakes. Um, studies show, vast majority of studies show that most of the human errors that are caused by physicians or providers are as a result of system failures. So we need to find and fix system issues so that we can have a sustainable improvement in patient safety. So there's a concept that was introduced uh, during that era that's called a just culture. What does just culture mean? That you want to make everyone feel safe so that they report their um, errors. So basically, if you're going to learn from your own mistakes, it's, you're not gonna make enough mistakes to learn and it's more efficient to learn from others' mistakes as well. So if you have a just culture where people are open to um, um, report errors, then you can learn better. For example, in the first case that I have mentioned on my first, second slide, remember, succinylcholine was found by the resident. Okay, she could have easily said, I don't know what happened. She, people would have been thinking, going through the di differential diagnosis of, uh, was it amniotic fluid embolism or was what was happening and what happened, right? And if you have a good culture where they know that they're not going to be reprimanded, and you know we make system errors, then you know people will come to you with these errors. So we have to recognize that the individual practitioner should not be held accountable. I mean, there are certain cases where there is harm. And as I will speak during the Just Culture Tool evaluation, but most of the cases where the system is failing them, you need to take, um, you know, recognize it and change um, the systems. So this is the goal that, to, you know, in order to change the system, you need to have a just culture so that people are, you know, um, are comfortable reporting these errors. And you translate it by making changes and having um, protocols and system changes. So the tools, what do we use as just culture tools? So these are the two forms that you can use. The first one is called the just culture tool. And the second one is the system error, a system error tool. And then you can use both these tools to cause, you know, have find and fix system errors. So just culture tool has three um, parts. Um, as you can see in these arrows, the first part is green, which is which says the follow the best practices. And the last part that is in red is impaired practices. And the middle section is where they did not follow the best practices, but you need to actually, it's a gray area. You need to have a, um, you know, a quorum to review these cases. So the first, Regardless of the outcome, for example, let me, let's say 
a child is given a penicillin who has no um, allergic reaction to penicillin and then they were given uh, medication in the same uh, category and the patient gets anaphylactic reaction and dies. So that's the, the provider still followed the best practice. So the outcome does not you know, determine whether the provider follow the best practice or not. And, you know, you need to uh, have a non-judgmental way to review the cases, not go by the outcome. So in this particular case, when we spoke about the succinylcholine, did the provider follow the best practice? No, not really. She should have read the uh, label before she administered succinylcholine to an awake patient um, instead of mistaking for phenylephrine, right? So impaired practices, so it's red. It's, it's an easy uh, decision to say that the pay, uh, provider was operating under um, you know, some kind of impairment by either substance abuse or by health issues or wanted to do the, uh, cause the harm intentionally. I hope this is rare and these things are something that you need to uh, immediately escalate to human resources and the chairman of the department so that immediate disciplinary action is taken. So this is easy as well. So what's difficult is the middle section where um, the provider did not follow the best practice, but you need to um, you know, see whether it's the patient, the provider is at risk behavior or reckless behavior, human error or question of competence. How do we do that? There is something called the substitution test which says whether a provider with an equivalent level of training could have done the same thing. Could you do that? Okay. And the test of intention, did the provider knowingly violate the standard of care? If yes, then it comes under either at risk or reckless behavior. And you're going to use the substitution test to kind of classify them into all four of these categories. So basically you need to have a big a quorum where you have to have experts in the field. For example, if you're reviewing a case of pediatric anesthesia, you need to have team members from pediatric anesthesia. If you're reviewing a case of a resident, you need to have a resident member in the quality improvement patient safety committee that is reviewing the cases and the CRNAs too. In our patient safety committee, we have one member from each um, each of the you know divisions, like a CRNA a couple of residents and each one from different divisions to have a proper review of these cases. So what's the system error capture form? So basically the top portion of this form has like patient information, uh, the name, the date, you know, and in short sentence, what happened to this case? And then system error identified and corrective action taken. So for example, if we are reviewing this same case where the sectional calling was given, you know, you're going to put that on the system uh, in a short sentence that by mistake syringe swap was happened. And what was the system error identified? We will go through it in the later. Um, I have some pictures of what, what exactly happened in that case and the corrective action, what you're going to do and the calculated hazard score. So calculated hazard score is very important in order to fix systems. It talks about the likelihood of occurrence, whether between one to 10. So one is least likely to occur and 10 is the most likely to occur. And likelihood of detection, least likely to detect is 10 and more likely to detect is one, severity is one to 10. So if you have a score of thousand, you know, 10 times 10 times 10, that means that you need to tackle this case immediately. It's, it's, it's a high impact and uh, very important. And then that way you can actually systematically put things that are high on the list to be um, uh, tackled by your QA, QI team. So in this particular case, remember I mentioned we will review this case. So if you can look at it, these syringes can look alike, right? However, if you look closely, there is a, there is a yellow sticker that's saying it's a paralyzing agent. And you, if you read the label, it's obvious that it's not phenylephrine. So yes, there is a human error involved in it. It's not best practice to give drugs without reading the medication. Um, and although the patient recovered uh, from the without any sequelae, but you can tell that this patient is gonna have PTSD for the rest of her life being paralyzed, right? There is a, you know, no physical harm, but definitely psychological harm um, uh, that is long lasting in this particular case. But if you, when we dig through this case, when we are reviewing this case, 
we noticed that succinylcholine syringes were in proximity to phenylephrine syringes. And someone put the succinylcholine in an epidural cord where it doesn't belong. Okay. And this particular system, uh, the hospital system had several different um, hospitals underneath and each hospital has a different setup. So it's not uniform. So when you go to hospital one, the syringes are placed in a different way. And then if you go to a hospital B, in the syringes are placed in a different way. So you have no uniformity and the paralyzing agents were right next to the pressors. And they did not have an anesthesia tech that's kind of cleaning up in between and maintaining tidiness. So if you just blame the resident that gave the wrong drug, you wouldn't have known that there are system issues and then would have had this occur to someone else. So the untidy workplace where we had education and then health and different ORs, we had them uniform and similar looking vials were separated by um, all these things. So you basically found the human error and you know reviewed it, put it, put it through the system error capture tool and then implemented the change to prevent future errors. So these are our, um, I know it's a busy slide. These are our 130 indicators we look at in our quality improvement patient safety. If anyone is interested, I'm happy to send it to them. They have sentinel events like mortality in the OR or mortality within 48 hours, admission to ICU to simple things like dental injury, corneal abrasions, postural puncture headache, et cetera. So we review these cases. We have numbers for these and also like, uh, for example, mortality in 48 hours is GN001. And we also have numbers for the attendings and residents. So we can track them by residents, track them by attending CRNAs, and track them by what kind of errors are happening. So in our hospital, um, we have targeted specific um, errors that we can be um, implement change. And what we use as a, you know, for, improvements is plan, do, check, act. So you plan what we are gonna do and then we implement that and then we check how we are doing and then we act on what needs to be done. So this is PDSA or PDCA cycle that we can use for quality improvement. And on sentinel events, for example, if you have a neonatal demise or anything that's dangerous, it does not um, you know, just need a QA review by one division, but then or one department you need someone from neonatology, someone from obst obstetrics, someone from anesthesia, um, OB anesthesia, et cetera. So now we do a root cause analysis in the hospital level where everyone comes together and describes what the problem was, if each division did a correct thing or not, and then what led to the outcome. And when you have errors occur in, you know, occur, errors occur and the harm reaches the patient when you have several holes in many layers of system defenses. So this needs to be reviewed during QA process. And the other tool that you can use is a modified fish diagram, where you look at the materials, personal communication processes, environment, knowledge, diagnostic, uh, reasoning, therapeutic choices, clinical assessment that are deficient that cause the adverse outcome. So I'm gonna give you an example of what we did at our hospital. We looked at medication errors and we saw that wrong doses and syringe ampules are the reason. And we looked at the literature and our error survey below the what 0.1 to 0.75 that was, uh, that was shown in the literature, but still we said there were some um, events that needed address. So we looked at the numbers. So when we looked at the numbers in 2012, we saw a bump in the, um, numbers and we said, okay, so there are two things happen. We have a just cultures introduced and people were more <clears throat> comfortable um, presenting these cases to the QA, QI committee. But again, we wanted to kind of tackle this anyway. So we gave two grand rounds about medication errors in May and November of that year. And we put the anesthesia patient safety medication safety video on our website. Everybody was supposed to watch it um, and then sign that they have watched it. It is available still on APSF website. And we asked the residents, our frontline doctors, what do you think are the problems and what are the uh, 
proposing solutions. And they said that maybe a drug map and the drug app and standardizing the trace and having an OR pharmacist is helpful. So we did that. And we had a mandatory anesthesia competency assessment for both residents and CRNAs in that beginning of the year. And uh, we standardized all of the trace in May of 2013. And we removed the vasoactive substances from other lookalike syringes, things like that. And we put all paralyzing agents in one area, all pressors in the other area. So there was a system in how the pharmacy start their um, carts. And then in June, July of 2013, we had like new orientation workshop for all incoming CA1s about drug safety. And after we did that, we saw a tremendous change and decrease in our medication errors. And we continue to do that now. So, um, so what you can do is look around and see what you can tackle and make safe choices and then have system errors. That's my advice to you. And, um, you know, this is, uh, I had the pleasure of working with um, uh, Dr. Joseph and Dr. Kamaratov, and I worked on this article and about OR efficiency and patient safety. I know sometimes we are into efficiency and then sometimes the production pressures can cause some errors. We had identified the errors that, that are caused as a result of overly enthusiastic um, production pressure, like syringe swaps, guide wires left in, or like wrong patient surgery or wrong sided procedures and contaminated instruments, et cetera. I mean, all these things can happen when you're um, having production pressures and OR efficiency at its best. And there are literature shows where people have been operated. For example, this is a case where a patient was taken to the operating room where they were trying to do the gallbladder removal surgery and they realized that there's no gallbladder to take up. So, you know, these kind of things are seen in literature. Um, especially when the your language barriers are um, in a different uh, hospital that we were helping review the cases, a stat C-section happened and they used the wrong PrEP. Instead of using the betadine PrEP, they used the PrEP with the alcohol, chlorhexidine PrEP that needs four to five minutes to um, dry and the patient ended up having third degree burns. So these things can be avoided by having system changes and education and famous people are not immune. You guys all know our beloved movie Bollywood actress, um, Sri Devi, who had her mom, uh, who had a craniotomy on the wrong side of the uh, you know, brain. So uh, these things do happen. So according to World Health Organization, to Aries human, we're all human, we make mistakes. To cover up is unforgivable. To fail to learn is inexcusable. And... Um, Thank you all for your attention and remember patient safety is everyone's responsibility and happy to, uh, these are my references and I'm happy to take questions when it is time for questions. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Reddy. Uh, this is an important topic and uh, I'm sure the Indian College of Anesthesiologists will do something for the college uh, so that hospitals in India can participate uh, to the maximum extent. There are gross errors and there are minor errors, but I think that will be the focus, one of the, one of the focus points of the annual meeting uh, this year. Uh, so let's move on now to the next speaker, Dr. Meera Gangadharan, and she will be talking on, uh, you know, tech, we have had technological advances, but these result in making small things, uh, batteries that look like swallowable items and uh, and this is a problem that is global and so she will talk about the swallowing or the aspiration of these batteries. Uh, Dr. Gangadharan is currently at the UT Health System at the McGovern Medical School. She's a pediatrician and also a pediatric anesthesiologist having completed both the residencies and fellowship in pediatric anesthesia. She's a chair of the special interest group on pediatric disaster preparedness. And she's a member of the Committee on Trauma and Emergency Preparedness. She's a fellow of, fellow of the Academy and member on the section on anesthesiology and pain medicine. And she also writes the question of the week for Congenital Cardiac uh, Anesthesia Society. So welcome uh, Dr. Gangadharan and you can share the screen and, 
and talk about this important issue. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see it and you can put it on presentation mode. Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Belani, for having me at this conference. And thank you, Dr. Radhakrishnan, Dr. Sood, and Dr. Murali Dharan, and all the other organizers. It is uh, humbling, and uh, uh, it, I truly consider it an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to discuss today the dangers of ingestion of button batteries. And um, it is something we all are aware of, and I hope this will be a good review for everybody and a reminder on this important topic. So this is me. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, button batteries are everywhere. They are all over our homes. They are in our thermometers. They are in our remote controls, in our toys. Um, they are in the in our keychains that have uh, lighters on them, fidget spinners, lasers, musical cards. Children love these things. They'll open and close them multiple times. Button batteries are shiny. They are round, and um, and like everything else, children put them in their mouths all the time. What is ironic about this whole condition is that. The incidence of the ingestion of button batteries has not changed very much over the decades, at least the last two decades. However, the incidence of significant morbidity and mortality has gone up tremendously. And this chart shows that it was between the years of 2005 and 2006 that the uh, fatality and complications from button battery injection rose, ingestion rose sharply. And this increase coincided with the introduction of the 20, millivolt, 20 millimeter, three volt lithium battery introduction into the market. This became much more widespread. It was present in the past, but after the year of uh, about 2005 to 2006, it, uh, it became very widespread. These batteries are large and they have a high voltage resulting in a very strong current that passes through the tissues. Um, on this surface, you see the positive uh, side of the battery, and this is the negative side of the battery. The positive side is larger, and it has these inscriptions. The first two numbers denote the width of the battery, and the second two numbers denote the height of the battery. If you, if you look at this uh, picture carefully, the the positive side is bigger and the negative side is slightly smaller. And this will, the significance of this will be explained in a few minutes. Now, how does a button battery injection, ingestion cause injury? So current flows from the positive to the negative electrode of the battery. And when this is up against tissues, this strong current is flowing through the tissues, causing hydrolysis of water, resulting in hydrogen and hydroxyl ions. These hydroxyl ions accumulate around the negative pole of the battery and cause a liquefactive necrosis of the tissue around it. The pH around the negative pole of the battery when it is in the human body can rise up to 10 to 13, which is like ingesting a caustic alkali. This uh, uh, video will show you how within 15 minutes of contact, a button battery will start causing injury to a uh, muscle. This is a chicken uh, fish, a chicken breast bone, and you can see within how quickly the battery is causing necrosis of this uh, meat. The most unfortunate part of this is that even after the battery is removed, once tissue damage has started, it can continue for days and weeks, leading to serious injury. So that is a pretty impressive video and it is available on YouTube. And uh, I think it is just startling how quickly these batteries can cause damage. 
Um, so these are some more pictures. Uh, this is uh, in the esophagus after battery has been removed, showing liquefactive necrosis and ulceration. And this is a picture that was actually taken in a journal. Uh, the hospital was in Jodhpur. And you can see there is a pneumomedia steinum uh, around the heart. And this was a battery that has stayed in place for about 29 days. Um, this child actually went on to live and survive this injury, but um, just goes to show how many structures can get involved when a button battery is ingested. So the esophagus is, relate, is in close contact with multiple important structures, depending on the level of um, on where the battery gets stuck. So you have the um, trachea, the thyroid gland, the aorta, subclavian vessels, mediastinum, pericardium, and at the back, you have the vertebral column. Now, we talked about the negative and positive poles of the battery. So it is the negative pole that causes most of the problems. So if the negative pole is oriented towards a major structure, it will, and it stays there for a long time, it will cause necrosis and injury and possible fistula formation, such as tracheoesophageal fistula, aortoesophageal fistula, the two leading causes of mortality in this condition, and then other problems like mediastinitis, aspiration pneumonia, and spondylodiscitis, depending on the location, orientation, and duration of exposure. This was a study from Lady Hardin College, and they showed that uh, in children from one to three years old, they tend to have the battery uh, getting lodged in the mid-esophagus more commonly than in other age groups. And as we know, this area is surrounded by many important structures. And this slide further lists all the complications that can occur, such as ulceration, necrosis, perforation, stricture and obstruction, bilateral vocal cord palsy, tracheoesophageal fistula, one of the sig very uh, significant complications, bronchopneumonia, spondylodiscitis, and the most dreaded of all, vascular involvement. Now, what are the risk factors for complications? So children less than six years old are at highest risk. The smaller the child, uh, greater the risk. The larger the battery, greater the risk. The more time the battery is in contact, as we've mentioned before. One of the um, mnemonics with which we can uh, remember this problem is the three ends. So we need to know where is the negative pole and how is it oriented? So how, as we mentioned before, the negative pole is the smaller pole. So in a lateral film, you can see a step off, which will tell you which way the negative pole is oriented and which structures are at risk of getting involved if there is enough erosion to cause a fistula. An AP view will show you a double halo uh, appearance of a button battery. And this differentiates it from other ingested objects such as uh, coins or anything else. And these two features, the double halo on the AP view, as well as the uh, step off on the lateral view, will, uh, will indicate that this is a button battery and needs to be treated with heightened precautions. The second N is the narrow, narrow part of the esophagus. So the narrower the part of the esophagus that it's lodged in, the more likely to cause damage. And of course, the more necrosis that occurs, the more likely we are to have damage. A sentinel bleed is a very important thing to keep in mind. If the child, if there is any report that the child has vomited even little specks of blood or coughed up even little specks of blood or has had dark stools, uh, these, this should really raise the level of concern when taking care of these patients, because this means that the uh, button battery has eroded through the esophagus into one of the vascular structures, and there is potential to create an esophagovascular fistula. And when that coin is removed, 
massive uncontrollable hemorrhage can occur, which has resulted in the death of several of these children. So while we, we know that going to a hospital and getting the battery removed is the most important thing to do in these situations, oftentimes hospitals are far away and we may not be able to get to them fast enough. So fortunately, there are some things that we can do to reduce and slow down the damage caused by the battery on the way to the hospital. And this involves giving 10, 10 ml or two teaspoons of routine good old household honey, any honey that is at home, two teaspoons every 10 minutes up to six doses. Now, keep in mind that children younger than one year can get botulism from honey, so it's not recommended in children less than one year. And if the... Uh, if the battery has been in place for more than 12 hours, or we think it's been in place for more than 12 hours, then honey is not indicated and nothing by mouth is indicated because the potential for perforation is very high. Up to 12 hours, we can go ahead and give honey in order to mitigate damage from the button battery. And this picture here on the right shows the experiment which uh, made uh, this recommendation possible and they took cadaveric piglet esophagi and they actually suspended them to, um, to uh, emulate the true esophagus in human beings. And they put a button battery and they dropped various um, liquid substances. And you can see how little damage is caused in the honey uh, group while there is significant damage in the saline group. Carophate also does a good job, but carophate is, of course, a prescription item and not as readily available in people's homes. Now, this is a treatment protocol that was brought about by the National Capital Poison Control um, Center. And this is a very detailed document, and I would really suggest that uh, keeping this handy would can be very helpful. Um, So there is a group which can be managed conservatively, and these are the older children, so more than 12 years, those who have swallowed smaller batteries, so less than 12 millimeters in size, in diameter, children who are completely asymptomatic. So they are swallowing well, they are not drooling, they have no strider, no difficulty breathing, they are doing just fine. If they have not ingested a battery with, I mean, a magnet with the battery, if there is ingestion of only one battery, there is no disease of the esophagus and swallowing functions are fine. And that the caregiver should be dependable, should be able to understand instructions and should be able to pick up on any symptoms and concerning uh, factors and bring the child back if needed. If these conditions are filled, then the child can be sent home without even an X-ray. However, uh, the we need to follow the stools of the child and make sure the battery is passed. And if it does not pass in 10 to 14 days, then a check strain chest, and then an X-ray needs to be done. And if the esophagus is in the stomach, it needs to be removed. In children less than 12 years, however, it is very important to immediately get an X-ray of the neck, chest, and abdomen assess the location and orientation of the battery. Based on the location, orientation, and duration of ingestion, um, the likelihood of complication should be evaluated. If there is co-ingestion of a magnet, then there is a possibility that surgery will be required. If it is deemed that the uh, magnet is not next to a vascular structure or, uh, you know, likely to have caused an esophageal tracheal fistula, then it can be removed endoscopically in the operating room under general anesthesia. After removal of the battery, it is important to inspect the mucosa endoscopically. And if the esophageal mucosa looks good, at, at least if it doesn't look like there's a perforation, then the proceduralist can irrigate the esophagus with quarter percent sterile acetic acid. This is a sterile product that uh, hopefully the pharmacy will have. 
and they can irrigate about 50 to 150 ml of this to uh, mitigate the damage caused by the battery. And this helps with reducing ongoing damage that can still continue after the battery has been removed. Most, most importantly, and this cannot be emphasized enough, the child needs to be monitored for delayed complications. There are endless case histories of complications that have occurred 10 days, 14 days, two days, four days, even up to 48 days after the battery has been removed if the child is not followed closely. And most of these are due to uh, esophageal vascular fistulae or esophageal uh, tracheal fistulae. Regarding anesthetic management for removal, first do not delay uh, uh, the procedure because of the nil paras status of the child. Assess risk for complications. And uh, I really encourage anesthesiologists to speak up in this regard. Very often we have a perspective on the patient and we are more aware of resources and what our institutions can offer than an individual proceduralist might be. Assign appropriate location and staff for the case. Get vascular access, monitors and blood products available if needed. A rapid sequence induction will probably be indicated, especially if the child has been taken honey. Spontaneous ventilation might be required if a bronchoscopy is, uh, is deemed necessary to evaluate the airway and assess the risk for a tracheoesophageal fistula. And remember that these children might need repeated procedures for CTs, MRIs, esophagoscopies and bronchoscopies to evaluate for ongoing damage after removal of the battery. This is a report by, uh, uh, by the CDC. It's a morbidity and mortality weekly report available on the internet. And this is from 2012. So it is a little bit old, but it is a list of, of uh, children who have died from, from ingestion of button batteries. And what was really striking to me was that all these complications occurred a few hours after removal and sometimes several days after removal. So again, the importance of ongoing monitoring. So post-operative care, while it may not be in the purview of anesthesia, we can at least be aware of the need for this and maybe we can speak up and support our colleagues who speak up because very often we all in no matter where we are practicing in the world, we get pressure to discharge patients. We are asked, why are we asking for a certain procedure? Oh, that's not necessary. These are all pressures we all, uh, we all feel, right? So if esophageal injury is seen on endoscopy, then the child needs to be observed in the hospital. And an esophagogram should be performed one to two days after the injury. If there's just a little mucosal injury seen, then the esophagogram can be performed the next day. Otherwise, it should be performed two days after to assess for perforation of the esophagus. If no perforation is seen, then one can go ahead and start feeding these children. And it is recommended that a soft diet be uh, given for 28 days to prevent further damage to the esophagus. While in the hospital, monitor the child for voice changes, respiratory distress, strider. And if, it is, uh, if there is a concern that, they might, that the ingestion was lodged proximal to the aorta, serial, ultra, uh, serial CT scans or MRI should be done for these patients. And uh, at least three millimeters of tissue should be seen between the injured esophagus and the large vessels. Very importantly, monitor for a sentinel bleed. Any signs of blood with coughing or vomiting or black stools or guaiac positive stools um, needs to be investigated very, very aggressively. Before I conclude, I just want to draw your attention to the fact we've talked about esophageal ba button batteries, but the children put batteries and any item anywhere. So the smaller batteries can sometimes be pushed up the nose or put in the ear and they cause damage in those areas as well. So this shows a nasal um, cavity with 
erosion and necrosis. And this shows the eardrum uh, external canal with the tympanic membrane showing uh, injury to these structures. In summary, for parents, keep children away from button batteries and in fact, all batteries actually. If they swallow a battery, take them to the hospital immediately. Give honey on the way if the child is older than 12 months and if we think the, inju uh, the ingestion occurred less than 12 hours ago. For anesthesiologists, assess the risks of removal based on location, orientation, duration, and signs and symptoms. Select appropriate staff teams and location for removal. Establish adequate vascular access and have blood products if needed. Be prepared for repeated imaging and procedures. And I should have added to this, do not hesitate to speak up because like I say, oftentimes we are best informed as to the different teams that are available in the hospital and the different resources available to the hospital. Some of the studies that, some of the cases that have been described even talk about taking these children to the cardiac cath lab if an aortoesophageal fistula is likely. And they even recommend keeping a wire in place with a balloon covered stent that can quickly be passed up that wire and occlude the hemorrhage from the aorta in case it were to occur should if when the battery is removed. So you can imagine a gastrointestinal doctor talking to a cardiothoracic surgeon, they probably may not feel very comfortable, but we in anesthesia who may have had contact with all these people because of the role we play, we may be more comfortable coordinating that kind of care. I thank you for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions um, in the question uh, session. I hope this has been informative and useful for you. Thank you, Dr. Gangadharan for an excellent review. Uh, I'm sure many people learn from this. I want to take this opportunity to thank all the speakers for doing such a wonderful job and making the talks so easily to follow. Uh, Dr. Kanchi, do you want to lead the question answers? Yes, uh, the lovely talks, really extraordinary talks. Uh, Up-to-date information was provided. Thank you very much. Um, to begin the discussion, um, Dr. Linderbaum, do you think intervention procedures done in hybrid ward will qualify as NORA? Um, a good question. And I think that most of the time since the hybrid OR um, is in the operating room, you, the resources you need and the design of that room typically takes the anesthesiolo anesthesiologist and, and in fact, the entire team into consideration. So my inclination Sorry. would be not to include those. I think so. I would agree with that. And I was very happy to listen to you. Uh, you said that we get much sicker patients in these situations. And the personnel in these um, areas are unfamiliar with anesthetic procedures and it becomes a real problem. Absolutely correctly stated and thank you for that lecture. And Dr. Basanna Gaudra said about the eight rules of the game, very well uh, pointed out how to titrate and the use of infusion pumps, monitoring saturation monitors, and uh, plan the management of adverse events, etc. Very well done. Uh, I don't think there are any questions on this matter. And uh, one thing Dr. I want Anna to... talked about pediatric GI procedures. Very well done again. She highlighted the patient factors, procedural factors how to have an anesthetic plan, what are the complications. Thank you so much. And uh, here also, I don't see any questions here. And the uh, quality improvement program talk was very good, very well done. Thank you. Uh, the just culture is very important and it has been highlighted. And the top 10 reasons for patient safety uh, violations 
were also mentioned. Thank you so much for that excellent talk, Dr. Samantha Reddy. And Thank you. Uh, last but not the least, we had the, the button batteries causing havoc. And it's a really important and interesting subject. Thank you so much for that. And if there are any questions, please unmute and we can ask the questions. Just wanted to make some comments. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. So uh, for Nora, I think Dr. Lindenbaum, it's becoming so common now to do these procedures. I yes. think it's incumbent upon, upon uh, sites to actually treat these as operating rooms almost. So I think so. When, when they have planning of any buildings or new facilities, they should be considered as operating room because more and more procedures are being done. The yes. cases are becoming more and more sick. The, they're sicker ASA3s. We might even do some ASA4s in those places. So NORA will become OR in the future, I think. I think <laughs> it can't be any different. But, but till then, I think there has to be a place for being able to handle emergencies, making sure we have all the facilities that we normally do in the operating room. Because when something goes wrong, nobody's going to tell you, hey, you're, you are in, an, in a different location. They'll say, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. So we have to be totally prepared. But, but till then, uh, NORA is becoming more common, sicker patients are being done, and more and more ambulatory facilities with the higher technology that's being produced are being able to do those procedures there. But we have to keep patient safety in mind and have transfer programs available if they need to be transported to a higher facility of care. And those should be immediately available. Contracts have to be in place and yes. patients have to be ready to be transferred to a willing facility because you shouldn't be looking for which facility is gonna be taking them. You have to have a facility ready if you're a freestanding ambulatory center. So that's, that's important, I think. Uh, I totally agree with uh, what all you said. I just wanted to like to know your opinion. Sometimes the sometimes some, some of these procedures are started in a local analysis here and the patient is not cooperative and then they call the anesthesiologist. And then uh, the, the, by the time anesthesiologist has reached the place, some sedation has already been given. And uh, the, uh, I mean, the appropriate dose or the my, my appropriate drug might not have been given. Do you encounter such situations? And if you do, how do you manage them? Uh, we do. Uh, that happens uh, commonly, right. more commonly than I'd like. Um, right. And I think that there's also another point, uh, another point that should be addressed. Um, one of the issues that comes up, uh, and I'll start with that if you don't mind. One of the issues that comes up here is um, many times people say, well, how can I even um, deliver anesthesia to this patient? I never talked to them. They, they didn't consent for anesthesia. Exactly. You know, that's exactly. The, right. And so, so that's another issue that I think needs to be addressed. Although in the U.S., generally speaking, the court's have uh, are in are in agreement that if you agreed to have the procedure you probably agreed to have the procedure without pain so so um you know it it may be okay to uh, uh progress in that point in that um way but typically uh to to address what you say there's little way to manage it other than giving the patient switching the patient to a general anesthetic because you don't know how much has been given or how they respond right. Right. And in order for you to keep it as safely as possible, rather than suddenly mixing drugs, yeah. uh, you may be best off doing it the way that you know. So, so I would say that that you know, it really also depends on the individual case. We have certainly encountered situations where we have decided the safest thing to do because the patient was so sick was yeah. to cancel it and reschedule it as a general anesthetic, or or at least as a as a case with an anesthesiologist. Right. Uh, oftentimes for the outpatients, the otherwise, if you have an otherwise healthy outpatient, you can usually pretty safely convert that to a more significant MAC case. And we yes. do that fairly common as well. 
but it's a very fluid situation. I think, again, it, it illustrates the importance of communication and understanding the location and, and those patients that you're taking care of. I think Absolutely. two, two things to pay attention to. One is you document what was going on so that that's well documented and right. you, have to, you have to do the needful to save the patient. So that has to be done. And secondly, if you find that this is happening with increasing frequency from, a, from one particular area, from whatever you may be connected, yes. then it's to have a meeting with those people and have them schedule those cases under anesthesia care from the beginning. And, and I think that's what we've done at our place. Uh, we've taken over, at least in the pediatric facility, uh, taken over the care of uh, all sedated procedures because we found that that increases efficiency and also makes it uh, very safe. Uh, and Dr. Swenson, uh, what do you think are the uh, complications that we see with uh, pediatric GI endoscopy? Uh, most commonly our airway complications, uh, such as uh, obstruction is very common, um, leading to desaturation uh, and uh, less commonly, but it does happen is aspiration. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of Dr. Gaudra's uh, rules applies with if in doubt intubate. Um, mm -hmm. I won't say we intubate with uh, every little doubt that we have, but um, <clears throat> we do uh, run into situations where we need to convert to intubation um, more commonly in patients that we probably had doubts about beforehand. Although sometimes they are unexpected. If a patient yes. unexpectedly has a fuller stomach, even if they follow the NPO rules, um, that's a probably the most common uh, situation that we that's unexpected but um if patients have risk factors like uh vomiting or they have a higher bmi and risk factors yes. for sleep apnea i think those are the most common things that we see as factors that lead us to intubate uh preemptively and if the pa or if the patient's very small and dr gaudra right. what about this dr gaudra what about using high flow nasal cannula more routinely and is it easy to monitor entitled co2 when you're using the commercially available high flow nasal cannulas that seem to fit so well in the nose unmute if you're talking dr gaudra You may have disconnected. I don't see him on the participant list. Oh, okay. he might have disconnected. He might have disconnected, okay. So anyway, the nasal cannulas are more commonly used, especially for patients where you have trouble monitoring the entitled CO2 and who are a little bit on the obese side, uh, have been using them more frequently. And they Good. seem to work pretty well. The only thing is you have to adapt it to be able to monitor entitled CO2 while doing this. And maybe Dr. Lindenbaum, you, you can share some experience if you've used them in uh, cases where you haven't intubated for endoscopy. Yeah, I, um, we, we have certainly. Um, uh, it, it, it's often a difficult situation. It's one of those situations where, you know, you, you, you need to weigh the risk of, needing to keep that patient intubated because of their pulmonary status in the first place. Um, and so I, I would say that we more often, uh, whether it's right or wrong, that more often we try to continue doing it with um, hi, uh, high flow nasal cannula. Um, and we look at more and more ways to provide adjunctive um, uh, uh, relief to the sedation, whether that's a, a block or something where we can more easily get away with it. Sometimes you just don't have a choice and you, you have to weigh the fact that the safety of the patient uh, really outweighs the, the likelihood that they're gonna end up um, uh, remaining intubated at the end of the procedure. Um, but we do see it a lot. It's more and more. Thank you. Yes. And Dr. Yes. Reddy, uh, for quality improvement and quality uh, management, 
Uh, what do you suggest places do to monitor the one or two issues on an annual basis? And is it easy to record these so that they don't have to fill out a, a separate sheet to document something that occurred in the during the daily work? Yes, I think uh, I think as I mentioned, quality improvement, patient safety is so important. When when I first took over QAQI in our division, it was a paper paper form. So anyone who wanted to not report it, but act like they're reporting it. I mean, there are lots of things. People are scared to report what went wrong. So what they used to do is make a copy of it, keep it for themselves and put it in a box. And you never have, it's like if someone found out about this particular case, you could say, hey, I have a proof that I have reported, but we would not get these. So what we have done is with this 21st century of where we have, you know, everything is on the computer. So we have actually made Microsoft Access database. And I've worked with our uh, IT group to make uh, electronic form. Um, I know in, in US we have Midas and several, like, uh, you know, you can buy these programs from them, but even in low resource places like in India and in small places, you can develop a form which goes to a, a common um, email. So it's like, you know, myself and one of the other directors, we, we would get the minute something happened and they sent it, I, my phone would go off that there is a QAQI has been submitted. So I think you can do it that way. And instead of writing the whole note for certain things like you have asked, um, about like, for example, corneal abrasion. I mean, it's a common thing that, that happens under general anesthesia, but then you want to track and trend about which providers are having these cases more often or dental injury. Like maybe there's a particular um, anesthesia resident that needs more help in learning to in intubate without injuring the teeth. So these things like we track and trend them by person and also by um by uh, the occurrence and those things, all they need to do is just check box about dental injury. And like, if they need to write it, they could say, hey, the patient had loose teeth and we didn't know about our loose teeth and they were already falling off. I mean, things like that. So I think certain things, all you need is a form. And I think in one of my slides, I had those 130 indicators. If you have yes, it yes. Or, Originally, I, I know one of, I think Dr. Sanish asked me for these and I'm happy to send it to anyone that is interested. And if I can help set up QAQI in India and places, I, I would love to. Um, you know, my mm -hmm. father passed away from a quality issue or patient safety oh. issue in India. Um, and this has been very near and dear to me. And if I can help any hospital set it up, run it, happy to do it. Um, I think electronic forms are better. And what they need to have is checklist of all the indicators and also as free space where they can actually write if they need to write it. For right. example, right. this sectional colon syringe in incident, if she only wrote, wrote like, I did not read the label, I picked up the wrong syringe, it doesn't give all the information about what was going on. I think we were only able to make system changes because we listened to all the things that the provider had That's to say, and true. she was comfortable yeah. enough to speak up. Hey, I made a mistake. And that only happens if we have a culture of safety and not blame. And well, I hope you. I answered your question, Dr. Balani. Yeah, I think Dr. you did. Uh, so they can pick up a simple thing, like now for battery ingestion that Dr. Gangadharan so well discussed, can maybe the hospitals need to look at the, the time it takes from the moment of ingestion till getting that uh, battery out could be one quality indicator for the GI people to look at to see how soon they can get that battery out. So that's an easy quality indicator to follow. Just like go to, right, go to balloon time. Go to balloon time. This is as important. And uh, <laughs> Dr. Gangadharan, you're muted. Uh, if you can tell us... Uh, uh, what can the battery manufacturers do besides education? I mean, once the battery is laying there, can they put it in some sort of a cover or something that keeps the negative part uh, safe so that so that they can't swallow it easily or it's protected so that they can't put it in the mouth, you know? What can they do? Um, 
I know there is a, there is a there is a uh, it's named after a child who had a, a fatal outcome after a battery ingestion. It's Reese's uh, law that's being passed in the U.S. and that's going that defines uh, how the manufacturers need to label these products and package these products. Um, they also, but they are not passing regulation in terms of producing new products that do not cause this type of occurrence to occur in the body. I'm not sure if the negative pole can actually be covered once it's, um, you know, when it is in use, but it can, everything can only be done before the battery is being used. But one of the things that they've also mentioned is that these batteries are very easy to take out like of the remote control or uh, thermometers and things like that. So that can be made more tight. Once it's in the device that's being used, it needs to be secured better so that children cannot get a hold of it so easily. What and happens if the battery is dead? Do we have a similar problem? If the battery life has gone and uh, it should not be as harmful. So that's a great question. Uh, the even if the so if the bat uh, the the more charge that's in the battery, the worse the damage. But even right. if it's e even as if it's not fully dead, if it's like half uh, charge or three, it still can cause a lot of damage. So right. it, no matter what the age of the battery, it's important to take it out quickly. Mm -hmm. It cannot be the charge cannot be neutralized from outside by any means. No, the charge only the way to only way to mitigate it is by um, have it drinking honey or uh, or yeah. uh, even they've done experiments with orange juice and like uh, like I see the 05 percent home vinegar is not recommended. They they recommend the sterile quarter percent. Um, so and vinegar is very sour. Children won't take it. So that's why they recommend the honey. But there are devices that are now being uh, in uh, sort of uh, research and even closer to actually manufacturing that can detect a battery without radiation, so without exposing the child to x-rays. So very often uh, foreign body ingestion we know is not witnessed and the signs are nonspecific. So because we might need to screen for this more often with a low index of suspicion, in order to reduce the radiation risk to the child, they are coming up with devices that can detect a button battery without uh, doing an X-ray. That is being uh, that is in the works. You always you. also mentioned about the use of a magnet. Why would they be swallowing a magnet? Also, uh, is that pretty common? Um. There are some devices that do have magnets as well. And there are, uh, you know, the ones that you stick to your refrigerator for, uh, uh, for yes. you know, souvenirs. And those are also round and small and attractive to children. And the problem when you have a magnet and a battery is they attract each other and there can be mucosal injury between the two when the mucosa gets caught. And that can result in intestinal perforation and uh, you know vascular compromise and all kinds of problems. It's actually been used therapeutically when you want to intentionally do that in cases of uh, esophageal atresia, where they actually pass a magnet from above and from below in the stomach and uh, the surgeons do it and bring it together and then you let the mucosa become a treading. So therapeutically it can be used, but if it's done in an accidental manner, it's not a good outcome. Thank you. Thank you. The speakers did a wonderful job, and thank you for the for the wonderful slides and presentations. Thank you, thank you so much. I just wanted to add on to Dr. Reddy's uh, talk on quality improvement. We had uh, this uh, Sapphire application on the mobile phone, which was used to record the adverse events, but it had so many um, aspects to be returned. So. We have gone back to the paper format. Maybe we'll improve upon the you know, phone, telephone based app. That is, uh, I think, very attractive because everybody has a uh, smartphone and these things can be entered then and there where it occurs and then it can be analyzed at a later date. Uh, Dr. Baljit, are you there? Dr. Murli. 
No, he may yes, not yes, be yes, there. Yes, yes, uh, can yes. I just make a comment? Yes, of course, the vote of thanks will be later. But uh, what I wanted to just add was that uh, in our hospital also, we are doing a lot of endoscopy procedures, yes. procedures. And uh, ours is a big department. It's consultant based. We have 45 consultants and about 25 students. But it is a rule in my department that for all these NORA procedures and endoscopies, an experienced anesthesiologist okay. with more experience should go. Otherwise, my stress levels go high. So these yes, points yes. are so valid that have been spoken and uh, very, very true. And we require expertise besides other things so that whatever Absolutely. is required has to be done immediately. Absolutely. Thanks. For the usual me. tendency is to send the junior most, but that should that, not be done. That's just not the that that case. Right. So, do you want me to propose the vote of thanks? Yes, yes, yes. Why not? Yes, uh, yes. Again, it's my proud privilege to be proposing this vote of thanks. And I think the first compliment goes to Dr. Bilani for yes. having chosen the topic, the title, and then the expert speakers. I mean, the lectures were so, so interesting and so practically oriented for all of us who have been in practice for uh, so many years and especially in the private sector. It's not that government sector does not pay so much of attention, but in the private sector, we all have to be very, very careful. So topics were so uh, well selected. And of course, the faculty who was involved is was extremely talented and we all gained a lot. So as Dr. Bilani has thanked everybody, I would like to again thank Dr. Larry, Dr. Godra, Dr. Swenson, Mira, and uh, Dr. Reddy. And thanks a lot. And we look forward to your participation. Dr. Bilani, thank you so much uh, for having conducted this international webinar. Murli, thanks a lot. Sanish, Dr. Radhakrishnan, good night, Dr. Baljeet, I think, has left. He had some work. And so we'll be seeing you next Wednesday and hopefully meet some of you in India in November. Thank you and good night and have a good day. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for Thank being here. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.